Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee of 2018. Uh, can I ask everyone to please to ensure that mobile phones are switched off or to silent? Uh, uh, you're very welcome to tweet or do other things of that sort, but please don't record or uh, film the session that is done uh, by the Parliament uh, for us. Uh, can I start today um, with a declaration of interests? And in accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, I will invite Keith Brown, as a new member, to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee. I did think this was about a list of your health conditions, but um, no, I have no, no interest to declare. <laughs> I can do Thank you very much. We'll take that as uh, no interest to declare, rather than as a medical uh, testament. Uh, but welcome, Keith Brown, as a new member to the committee. We will have another new member next week. But can I take this opportunity to uh, thank Ash Denham, Kate Forbes, Ivan McKee and Alison Johnson for their work while members of the committee uh, and to congratulate those who have gone from here to ministerial office. Uh, clearly the work of the Health and Sport Committee provides many uh, opportunities to address uh, issues and take those forward and the work of all of those four members has been much appreciated uh, by me and by the committee as a whole. Can I now move to the second item on the agenda, which is to choose a new deputy convener. Uh, the Parliament has agreed that members of the Scottish National Party are eligible for nomination as deputy convener of the committee. Uh, given that, may I invite nominations for the post of deputy convener? Convener, could I nominate Emma Harper as deputy convener? Thank you very much. There being one nomination, I am pleased uh, to ask the committee to agree that Emma Harper be chosen as deputy convener of the committee. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Congratulations to Emma Harper. I'm very much looking forward to working with her as deputy convener in the months and years ahead uh, and contributing as she has done so much already to the work of this committee. We move on now to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. Uh, we, will, uh, we have in front of us uh, one negative instrument, the National Health Service General Ophthalmic Services Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Are there any comments from members of the committee on this instrument? If not, does the committee agree to make no recommendations? That is agreed. Thank you very much. And move swiftly on to agenda item four, which is to take evidence uh, on the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. And we have two evidence sessions this morning. Uh, I anticipate they will both uh, last roughly an hour each and an opportunity for members to ask our witnesses about uh, aspects of the bill. Can I welcome to the committee Dr Sally Gosling, the Assistant Director of Practice and Development with the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, uh, Kim Hartley Keane, Head of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists in Scotland, representing the Allied Health Professions Federation Scotland, and Patricia Cassidy, Chief Officer, Falkirk Health and Social Care Partnership, representing the Chief Officers Group uh, and uh, for Health and Social Care Scotland. Welcome uh, to the committee, and we'll go straight uh, to questions. And can I ask each of the uh, witnesses to kick us off to outline briefly uh, main concerns and uh, considerations in relation to the Bill's proposals? Who would like to start? Sally Gosling. I'm happy to start. Thank you very much. Um, if you could just give me a wee second to sort out my paper. <laughs> Papers, because I wasn't expecting to do that. Um, well, first of all, just thanks for the opportunity to speak to the committee this morning. I'm representing 12 allied health profession professional bodies, so real value for the committee this morning. You're getting 12 for the price of one. Um, it's music therapists, art therapists, drama therapists, occupational therapists, dietitians, prosthetists, orthotists, orthoptics, physios, physiotherapists, paramedics, speech and language therapists, podiatrists and radiographers. Um, so that's quite a lot of different professions I'm here representing. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to have to, uh, our 
I'm going to have to sort out my notes here. Thank you. Um, we account for um, over 11,500 11 members of staff. That's 8.3% of the workforce, which compares quite well with 8.9% of the workforce made up of medics and dentists. Um, we work in health and social care. OTs are employed by social services. Birth, from birth to palliative care, public health, prevention, primary, secondary and community care. It would be pretty challenging to find um, a care group for whom HPs don't work. I've got five key points that I wish to get over and I'll do it as quickly as possible. First of all, about we don't believe the bill will achieve its objectives. It's not future focused. We've got several fears, significant fears about the bill and that none of the professional bodies I'm representing, all 12 of them, can support the bill as it stands. But we do offer some solutions. Um, first of all, it won't achieve its objectives. Only the right staffing team can provide the highest quality of care, leading to the very best outcomes. In that sense, legislating for the right staffing presents a really great opportunity. So in principle, we like the bill, but it's not outcomes focused. Instead, it's focused on a very restricted range of inputs, which is its big challenge. It's not future focused. The bill plays to an old unidisciplinary siloed model of health and social care, which seems to go against the grain of uh, modern models of health and social care. Those, those that are promoted in the GP contract, the national clinical strategy, and most recently in the workforce plan um, part three. Um, HPs work in all, uh, all of the 11 types of health care listed. Um, it doesn't reflect the reality of the multidisciplinary working. Um, and in fact, some parts of the bill explicitly seem to specifically exclude AHPs. The part uh, 121C, which talks about the list of employees um, are identified as registered <laughs> nurses, midwives and medical practitioners, along with those working under the supervision of those staff groups. Allied professions don't work under the supervision of any of those staff groups. And for 40 years, we've been autonomous clinicians. So the bill doesn't cover, uh, doesn't cover that. It says that it's multidisciplinary, but the financial <coughs> guidance is pretty disheartening. It seems to indicate that it'll be up to 10 years plus until we see any multidisciplinary tools. It's not needs-based. People need AHPs too. And this is all about doctors and nurses. So just on to our fears. Our fears are shared by the HP directors. Those are the people that are working out there in the service already trying to run HP services. It will, it will create unintended consequences, and that will skew the resources away from financial distribution, away from um, the, the, the dire financial distribution now. Because directors are likely to say, "Sorry, we can see what you like. We can see what you mean about needing more HPs or needing multidisciplinary teams, but my hands are tied by this legislation." Um, our, fun, our fears are grounded in reality. If you compare the central government funding for nurses and doctors. Say, for example, the 500 million plus, no one says that, that shouldn't have happened for, for uh, primary care, but that compares to the 3 million announced for HPs in 2015. We've not heard any more about any other money for HPs since then. There's a sense that we've been forgotten. If you look at the process that the bill was, the, the bill writing, we were excluded from, excluded from that. In, that's sort of indicative of organisational habits. There's one reference to us in the bill on page 93 of the policy memorandum, and I'm sure everyone can remember what that says. Um, the, the, nursing, the Scottish Government Nursing Directorate itself says the potential for resources to be diverted to nursing and midwifery to meet the mandatory requirement could be the detriment of other professionals contributing to the care. So it seems it's recognised, but it's a problem. And as I said, none of the professional bodies that I'm here representing can support the bill as it is now. What we'd like to see is an outcomes focus on the general principles, but to create a general presumption that quality and safety are best supported multidisciplinary teams, and to re replace the list of tools in section 121C with a, a section establishing a statutory duty on, for example, his, which would be equivalent to SISGISWIS, which would to annually or biannually review and improve the common staffing method, including tools to reflect the developing evidence base of multidisciplinary staffing, and to make and for that same body to make annual or again biannual recommendations to the minister on improving the tools. Um, and that I think is all I want to say. That's very comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, Sally Gosson. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I mean, I'd like to add to um, much of what Kim has already said, and obviously, um, as Kim has said, the CSP is, is part of the HP Federation for Scotland. Um, if I briefly outline 
um, some additional issues um, that um, relate to our concerns about the legislation as it's currently couched. Um, I think the first point to make is that we believe very strongly that a multidisciplinary team approach has to be taken to staffing levels, and we believe that that has risks for the quality of patient care, both in terms of experience and outcomes, unless a multidisciplinary team approach is taken. It also has risks for staffing um, and risks um, focusing staff level um, legislation on one part of the workforce and potentially depleting other parts of the workforce, potentially adding to staff workload in ways that are obviously unhelpful and unintended. We also think the um, staffing leg levels legislation assumes um, that looking at staffing levels in isolation um, will make a difference to the quality of patient care, uh, both, again, both in terms of experience and outcomes. And we strongly believe that just looking at staffing levels in isolation cannot address the need. It, it risks a very partial approach being taken. Um, it risks um, not looking at the outcomes for patients, and it risks, at, at, at best, looking at avoiding negative outcomes for patients or negative incidents. Um, we think it ha has a risk of building in rigidity and inflexibility when, obviously, as Kim has said, there's a need to f focus on future service delivery models and ensuring staffing is responsive to uh, and able to, to meet the, those future um, or current and, and future staffing um, service delivery models rather than being grounded in um, uh, historical models. We think the legislation risks being a distraction um, and it risks creating a bureaucracy. So really um, investing staff time for those staffing groups um, that would come under the legislation in gathering data about activity, but without um, a real focus on what the benefit for that will be. Um, and I think the um, survey that I think the um, Parliamentary Information Centre undertook recently seemed to affirm that, in, at least in terms of how the tools are currently used, there's a lot of activity invested, a lot of time invested in using them, but not a clear sense of what impact that has in terms of analysis being taken forward of staffing issues or there being accountability for making decisions and acting on, on what that usage of, this, of the tools may, may indicate. So on that basis, we do think the existing nurse staffing level tools, the workload management tools, et cetera, are an odd place to start with legislation. And certainly to embed them in the legislation seems to, again, build in um, rigidity, inflexibility, and a lack of responsiveness to changing the population patient need, but also service delivery models. And again, that seemed to be borne out by the survey feedback that's been obtained where nurses using the, the tools were reflecting that already they don't um, capture how they're working, how they're contributing to patient care. So I think that risks grounding it in historical um, issues. I think we're also concerned that the tools are not in the public domain, so we're not able to see, uh, as I understand you won't be able to see what the tools are at the moment, but also we don't understand they've been evaluated. Um, so we have some concerns on that front. We believe strongly that a whole systems approach must be taken to staffing levels. So again, reflecting changing models of delivery, moving care closer to home, um, obviously integrating health and social care and delivering the Scottish um, health and social care delivery plan. We feel that the grounding of the legislation at the moment could actually work against delivery of, of Scottish health and social care policy, including by only taking a partial approach to staffing. We then think it does generate the risk of unintended consequences and creating sort of perverse incentives, perverse unintended um, activity. Um, and that, again, is grounded partly in the, the singular approach to one, obviously very significant, but one staff group. Um, it could obviously distract resources to meeting the needs of the legislation, but not actually meeting service delivery needs or patient needs. Um, so we would have strong, uh, strong concerns about the, the sort of perverse um, activities. And I think that's borne out by some evidence around where legislation has been introduced, particularly for nursing and particularly perhaps in um, individual um, states where the, the impact of the legislation hasn't been what was intended. So I think we, we, we have concerns that, that that is a risk. And I suppose lastly, just to say that we, we recognise absolutely the spirit in which the legislation has been introduced and we recognise it's intended to um, enhance patient care 
and obviously to address issues of staff wellbeing, but we don't believe that as it's couched, it will currently do that. So we think it needs to be much more responsive to changing population patient needs, much more in line with health and social care policy, um, and to be much more focused on, on being integrated into that. So I suppose in terms of what we'd be looking for is legislation that's much more strategic in its approach, much more integrated, so not sitting in isolation, and also introduces a much stronger sense of accountability. So it isn't just accountability for demonstrating use of the tools. We need to see accountability for integrating a strategic approach to workforce planning, workforce deployment, etc. OK, thank you very much. Patricia Casti. Thank you. <coughs> Um, a <clears throat> very welcome opportunity to come and speak to the committee. Um, I'd like to prefix my comments by just remembering the focus of everything that we do, and it's around person-centred care, and to ensure that that is flexible, responsive, and safe, as well as high quality. Um, the chief officers, I'm here representing the 31 chief officers for health and social care <clears throat> across all of the integration authorities in Scotland. Our initial response to the consultation in July 2017 made it clear we did not support safe staffing tools which protected only one element of the health and social care workforce. However, conversely, it didn't infer that we were in favour of tools being extended to other parts of the workforce. We responded to the second consultation and this restated that while we, <coughs> excuse me, we understand both the political and public desire to ensure that our health and social care services are appropriate resource in terms of staffing, our position remained the same, that we'd be cautious about supporting a legislative approach for several key reasons. There is potentially a significant additional layer of administrative bureaucracy being added to existing systems. Our challenge in the whole system currently is to ensure that if people do not need to be in an acute hospital, we have sufficient um, care, health and social care um, provision in the community to keep them out of hospital. If they are in hospital, we need to be sure that we can receive them back into the community and support them to be re-abled re in the community. This requires us servicing acute hospitals, community hospitals across Scotland and being able to be very quick and responsive to anticipate needs and anticipate the volume of care we need to provide ourselves or to commission from other providers. So we'd be very concerned if the legislative process did impede that as opposed to adding benefit and impact and our ability to respond to that need. There is a risk that the legislative requirement to use particular tools could stifle innovation. We're in a very exciting policy landscape in health and social care in Scotland, where is big transformation in actually developing community-based needs. The health and social care partnerships are not solely about NHS boards and the councils, though they are important partners. Our key partners are communities, the individuals themselves and the third sector. And we'd be very concerned that we became preoccupied with a tool where there's existing legislative framework and inspection framework in place and the new health and social care standards that maybe preclude our innovation and our development at locality level to work with families, communities and third sector partners to develop a whole range of supports in communities to enhance people's well-being. Because it's not just about providing care and support. A main issue in Scotland is around isolation. And we need to work with other providers and communities to provide solutions for that. So we, we are concerned that any tool that is developed needs to be sufficiently flexible and dynamic to allow for the developments that we will be leading in the next few years to meet um, local need. And it is very much about local need. We're talking about very diverse communities, geographies and landscapes across Scotland. And I know that colleagues in the islands and rural areas are very concerned about any restriction to their ability to respond to local need appropriately. And uh, I must emphasize with safety and quality of services absolutely at its heart. We are concerned that legislation is still quite restrictive and colleagues from um, allied health professionals have laid out their concerns 
and, and we would be equally concerned. In the health and care service at the moment, there's quite a lot of development of advanced roles to support general practice and the delivery of out of hours and other services. So we would like to continue looking at that and looking at nothing as dropping off the other end of these nursing and other roles. And actually, what's the workforce that we need? Is it a blended workforce? Is there a, a baseline workforce that we can actually create pathways into a variety of health and social care professions by having a, a ground a ground level opportunity? We're all facing significant recruitment and retention issues across every element of health and social care. There's a dem demographic challenge facing us all, and we need to be able to develop services that respond to that reduction, perhaps, in the availability of employees and recruitment opportunities to develop quite innovative solutions to attract people in, to retain them, and actually to develop them into perhaps more senior or sophisticated roles to meet need across the whole system. So finally, just to sum up, legislation should not create rigid compliance framework that undermines the new integrated environment for health and social care. Each partnership is expected to work at a locality level, identify local needs and then meet those needs. So we would need to be very, very responsive. Um, Part two, which is focused on staffing in the NHS, does not take cognizance of the significant overlap of governance responsibilities between health boards, integration joint boards and local authority, so would require um, clear guidance. There is a tremendous diversity in the workshop, workforce in health and social care across providing care at home, providing care home provision and intermediate <coughs> care. And the one-size-all one approach to workforce planning simply won't work. So it's a case of we've got a potential legislative framework, but it needs to be contextualised within that much broader national workforce plan that's happening nationally across all of the professions, but also looking forward with our colleagues in schools, colleges and university as to what actually could be quite innovative health and care careers, what we could actually feed people into through various pathways and then on perhaps into the professions. And okay. I thank you very much for the opportunity to, to give an input. I'm happy to take any questions. Th thank you very much to all three witnesses for laying out in, in some detail the concerns that you have. Um, don't feel the questions and answers uh, henceforth th will be through the chair. Don't feel that you have to respond to each question, but pl please do respond where uh, it's something on which you wish to comment. Can I start with Sandra White? Thank you very much, Chair, and welcome, and uh, thank, thank you very much. A number of the questions I was going to ask, obviously, about integration and uh, health and social care, you've, you've actually given me some answers, but if I could just maybe pull it a wee bit more out. I mean, the bill is uh, hopefully, and it's meant to enhance the work that's going on with health and social care and uh, integration, but obviously behind your replies, uh, and thank you for that as well. So I just want to touch on one of them uh, and ask you about the bill as itself is, now, the bill proposals, I want to ask you, you've already mentioned about what effect it will have uh, in great detail, but what effect do you think it will have, the bill, if it is passed without any uh, due care and diligence and looking at, basically, the integration of health and social care? What do you think will happen if we do not change the bill to take into cognizance of what you've been saying today? Patricia Cassidy. Um, thank you. I think it could drive resource to focus on being compliant with the requirements of the bill, which potentially could add um, more administration, potentially divert resources from frontline care. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we will receive, for social care, we will receive referrals from emergency department directly, from the hospital discharge team, from GPs, from families, from social workers. Um, and so that can be quite a significant volume of work and we need to flex our system to provide, to make an assessment, to provide that care, to link with allied health professionals, to provide a rounded package of care, provide equipment and do that across a range of several thousand people on a daily basis. 
it may require us then to um, commission additional provision if we can't meet it internally to go to one of our providers. We would need to be assured through a commissioning process that that provider was also compliant and we'd need assurance in, in that regard. And the, the whole thrust of outcome-based care is actually <coughs> assessing with the service user and their family and identifying what their personal outcomes are and then agreeing a way that we will jointly work towards those outcomes. So it's just it's adding, we already have checks and balances in place, as you would expect, to ensure that we're commissioning and employing sufficiently registered and high quality and trained staff, and that there is that coverage across um, the people receiving care, but this would bring in another, another dimension. Thank you. Um, our central fear is the outcomes for service users. Um, that skewing resources towards where there's legislation towards the, the those professions covered by the tools. Um, already, um, there's significant cuts that have happened um, for AHP service users. Um, there's a quote from my radiography colleagues that said. At present, radiography departments are running with gaps in rota due to unfilled vacancies, maternity and sick leave, which are treated differently in AHPs than they are in other professions, leading to delays in examinations, reporting of results, radiotherapy treatment, as well as increasing stress on radiographers. Um, again, another colleagues um, in another professional body, basically, it's going to mean less AHPs on all those different care pathways. For example, multidisciplinary teams develop delivering rehab in the community settings, preventing hospital admissions and readmissions, and reducing length of stay, um, and restoring function, increasing people's, people's independence. Um, all those things would be in jeopardy. They're the new models about prevention and self-management, enabling people to live in the homely settings. That, that's, that's, that's the issue. That's what's a threat. Thank you. I, mean, I think just to add to what colleagues have set, said, I think it does risk um, the issues that Patricia highlighted around skill mix and job role reconfiguration across health and social care not being addressed. I think it also risks um, the assurance being given to the public that staffing level issues are being addressed, when in reality the legislation as it stands wouldn't address actually increasing workforce supply or addressing workforce needs um, in line with population patient and, and service demand. So I think it, it risks appearing to provide a solution when it wouldn't do that and it would distract attention away from more strategic appro approaches in line with, with policy. Uh, thank you. Um, just to sort of a, maybe get a one, a one letter answer before we go on to the next one. Uh, basically what you're saying, if a set of workforce planning tools for nursing is put on a statutory footing, that would have the effect you're talking about just now, it would have an adverse effect on health and social care? Be because if you're, yeah, that, that if you're um, a director, you might see that there's a need for multidisciplinary team planning. If only one member of that team is statutorily protected, if you like, in terms, or not, mm. the needs of the service users of nursing, and it's the, it's the service users. Mm -hmm. the, the interests of those that are using those other members of the multidisciplinary team haven't got the same uh, legislative protection. You're obviously going to make sure you've got the staff for nursing first, rather than looking at what's the skill mix we need. Yeah, okay. Chair, could I come in? Um, I, mean, I think it was Patricia that mentioned the IGBs, uh, basically, and we know that they don't have a statutory duty to produce a workforce plan at the moment, and they're not employees either, uh, basically. Uh, so I just wondered, um, how, how do you see that working then for the integration authorities? You mentioned that Patricia yourself, that you obviously work with them. Um, do they need flexibility? Do they need to be involved in this uh, plan, this bill that's coming out? Integration board, joint boards are required to produce a workforce plan. It's part of yeah. the integration schemes. So we are working on that. We work very closely with colleagues in the council and in the health service. There's those employees remain their employees, but we have to jointly create a workforce plan. Apologies for that. I, I, I missed up a bit about that, <laughs> that particular, particular bit. Uh, but as the bill as it stands, do you think that the integration authority, you know, the IGBs, 
either have less authority or, or, or more through this bill? I don't think the bill adds or detracts from that authority. I don't think it adds any significance in that way. I think it, we are cited in the bill and we're obviously key stakeholders in the bill, but we have to work and we will always work mm -hmm. with our colleagues in the NHS and in the councils. Um, I have some experience working in education previously and I would be concerned that, as my colleague described, that perhaps one profession or one in two or two professions have legislative protection in terms of numbers. And, you know, we've seen that in education where, because of teacher numbers, it can often mean that classroom assistants, bus escorts, etc., are subject to cuts um, against the backdrop of the, the protecting the pupil-teacher ratio and the teacher numbers in schools. So I wouldn't like us to not learn from that, to absolutely mm -hmm. recognise that there is a complexity of skills that are required to meet need, and each of those skills is, is valid, but would need to be considered using professional judgment, what combination of those staff members or skills that you would need. Mm -hmm. um, but that is much more subtle than perhaps a legislative tool mm -hmm. could allow. Absolutely. So, yeah, so one last question, Sandra. Just one last question. You're talking about workforce as well. I mean, um, whose responsibility would it be or is it uh, to ensure adequate supply of workforce if this bill goes through without people having a say in it? I, th I think I would need to bow to colleagues who had more um, detailed knowledge of the legislation to, to be able to answer that, I'm afraid. But certainly the integration joint boards and the health boards and councils work very closely together and, and at this time share that responsibility. I can't, I'm not aware. Thank you. I, mean, I think at the moment it's not clear that the legislation would address the workforce mm -hmm. planning issue. Um, and I think, for again, for the allied health professions, there isn't a workforce planning process yet in place in Scotland. I think what is important, which fits very well and strongly with the integration agenda, is looking at workforce needs across the whole system. So not just looking at NHS workforce need, but looking at um, workforce need where it comes from whatever part of delivering care to patients, as, w as well as um, leadership management, education research capacity as well. So I think the legislation as, as planned doesn't address that, but we, we would see that it's, it's, it's a, a sort of imperative above and beyond the legislation that's presented that a much more strategic approach is given to what workforce is needed and how is that best delivered and produced and how, how is investment appropriately made, the workforce developed to meet changing population and patient needs. And that can only really be done in a multidisciplinary way to, to, to meet the, the, the blended skill mix approach that's required. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. David Stewart. Uh, Convener, can I thank our three panellists for, I think, the excellent contributions they've made. I'd like to focus and drill down in a bit more detail uh, on looking at um, staff planning out with uh, nursery and midwifery. Uh, we hear frequently in this committee about major problems in Scotland about recruitment uh, and retention. To what extent will this bill aid uh, your problems dealing with recruitment and retention? Who would like to start? Sally okay. Gosling. Thank you. Um, well, I suppose I'm not clear that the legislation as, as couched would help address those issues, because um, I don't think it, it's not premised on those issues. It's looking at staffing levels for the, the staffing body that's already there, obviously, again, within one profession. I think we're certainly keen that the, the broader issues around workforce planning, development and investment are looked at. Um, such that recruitment and retention are addressed across all uh, staff groups. Um, I think, again, for AHPs, there isn't, there isn't a, 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 at the moment a strategic process such that those issues can't be, um, they, they can't currently be addressed. There isn't a, um, possibly sufficient data on which to um, understand the recruitment and retention issues. And I suppose it's one um, example of just from a workforce supply perspective, um, for many of the, or a number of the HPs, um, workforce is produced through postgraduate pre-registration education routes, and those are very well established. They've existed in physiotherapy in Scotland for well over 20 years, but those aren't funded. 
Um, so the students going through those routes are self-funded, but that could be a very useful way of, of expediting workforce supply if that route was funded. So I think it's the sort of mixed economy approach at the moment that, and the, the lack of data that makes addressing that issue diff difficult, but I don't think the legislation that we're considering here really touches on those issues, but it needs mm. to be integrated into mm. a more strategic mm. approach. Um, um, I think your question touches on just the clash between other policy and this legislation as well. That we've um, we've already we've talked previously about the well. First of all, in terms of the recruitment, um, Workforce Plan Three talks about considering in, um, increasing or, or controlling the numbers into some of the AHP professions and um, increasing the number of paramedics in training, but there's nothing in this bill that will enable there to be jobs created mm. in order to meet that, you know, for those people to have, they're needed for, for jobs and um, for those people to, to go to. And I think in terms of retention, um, again, because it's very focused on one discipline, that investment in CPD and the continuing professional development, the career structure for um, others um, is, is um, in doubt. If you look at the um, workforce data that is available across the, the professions, the, there's been a very small growth in, um, in AHPs and they've primarily been at band five, which is where you go when you're a new graduate. There's really nowhere to go and this, this, this bill does nothing to, to address that. I think, to be fair to the bill, it doesn't <coughs> purport to be the workforce plan, um, and there is nothing there that I would say gives assurance or opportunity that it would contribute or improve the situation around recruitment and retention at this stage. Could I move on into a second area that Sandra White's touched on briefly as well, and that's the issue of uh, of planning tools. That's a big element, uh, particularly within obviously nursing and midwifery, but looking out with that area, um, when do you see multidisciplinary tools being created for, for example, the social care sector? And if you do see them being created in the future, can you give some sort of time scale of when that would be a practical use to those in the industry, and particularly, obviously, to, to clients who are getting the service across Scotland? Kim Hartley. Kim. Um, well, the only clue as to where in, to answer that question in the um, in the in the bill is around the financial memorandum, um, and it uh, implies uh, it details how the development of tools for the next five years is already planned, and that the tools take a minimum of three years to develop, and they'll be focused on nursing. Um, and therefore, we wouldn't. We believe that there's a risk that we, we won't see any multidisciplinary tools for up to ten years if we followed the financial memorandum, which means that will be ten years behind a policy which is current. That's a long time. Yeah. Well, that's ten years for um, people waiting for adequate AHP services and for for well for the whole. For us to establish the vision that we share in, in terms mm. of prevention, self-management, mm. enabling people to stay at home um, and, and cared for at home. Yeah, mm. that's, that's just totally against the grain of yeah. what we're trying to do. Anyone else like to comment? Sally Gosling. Sorry. Um, I, mean, I think I would agree um, that it, it seems unclear how, at what time, it seems a long time scale uh, through which they could be developed. I think one issue that it may be helpful to raise is that as AHP professional bodies, yeah. we do have quite a lot that we could contribute yeah. to the development of multidisciplinary t uh, tools. Um, I think a number of us have done quite a lot of work around safe and effective staffing levels, taking a more um, nuanced approach to the complexity of issues that um, are, are bound up with that. So I think we have work that we could contribute. Um, to developing something that was much more multidisciplinary in its approach. So just to th thank you. So absolutely, the, a lot of the professional bodies have, have something there, and it's, it's, it would be inaccurate. It's important to point out as well, there already are multidisciplinary tools out there that are being used by AHPs. They're not, they're not in, um, they've not got the same level of 
publicity, I suppose, or, or knowledge is the um, at level of investment, certainly, as the, as the tools that are in the current bill. There's something called the Six Steps Methodology. There's something called the Balance System that's recently been piloted by Scottish Government looking at HP provision in children's services. So there is something to build on. This isn't to say the bill as it stands would take 10 years, but it doesn't have to be like that, I suppose. Could come back again. Sorry. To respond to your previous point. Um, it was just to say that the government and COSLA have um, co-produced a national health and social care workforce plan, part two, in 2017. And that um, one of the recommendations proposes the development of multidisciplinary workforce planning tools. I'm not sure what the time frame for that is, but that is work that I understand is underway. And the development of what's called a dependency tool, which is looking at actually the acuity of need in the care sector. And that work will help inform staffing models and also the National Care Home contract as well. I think Patricia Cassidy has covered partially the point, my next point, but um, just, just to be totally clear, currently when we're talking about multidisciplinary teams in hospitals and in the community, in reality, how is staffing calculated? It's, it's quite a complex and dynamic <laughs> issue trying to calculate staff. So currently, and there are some tools that can be used. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, certainly, well, I, I, not as a practitioner myself, but the tools that um, the the tools that people are using, um, for example, the balance system. Is that is that your? Yes. Just to be clear on your on your question, um, one of the things what what they've done is children and young people. Um, need services at several levels they need a universal provision so that we're developing to all children's capacities and um, we need targeted for those children who are targeted level provision for those children at risk of having poor outcomes and we need specialist provision for those children who have identified disabilities identified additional support needs and the balanced system is a way of looking at the workforce and the, the assets that are available in the school and the family and the community, as well as among um, all the HPs to see together how many HPs do we need in order within that context, <coughs> within that population, that particular population would be Ayrshire, Lothian, whatever. Right, What's the system that we need? And, and it's really coming back to the point that mm. Patricia made. This is about looking at population need and starting there yeah. with your workforce yeah. planning, not with the how many have we got. And, uh, I mean, Could I just make a general, perhaps simplistic point, but it would be useful uh, uh, to hear your views on this. Some have said to me, and certainly this is through in the contributions received to the committee, is that why do you need legislation to have workplace tools? Because good management would normally involve that anyway. You don't need legislation for that. Uh, that's probably a simplistic overall view, but I would certainly be uh, useful to hear what you, the three of your views are on that particular general point about the bill. Briefly, yes. Just to reiterate what our, our response has said, that we feel that there are existing tools in place and that we don't see the need for legislation in this regard. However, we do embrace the need to have work, good workforce plan, planning for multidisciplinary teams. Um, yes. From my perspective, I think, uh, from our perspective rather, um, it's about introducing some consistency in the in the intelligence that you need in order to be able to produce a staffing your staffing complement for your particular community and um if it were more multidisciplinary it would it would it would provide support to the delivery of that new model um, by reflecting all those different there's, there's a lot of good things in the bill um, about the things people have to take into account in the common staffing methodology I suppose what we're wanting, it's, it, it, because it's very complex, it's going to be very difficult to ever reach perfection, I suppose. But what we want to do is move a wee bit away from a wet finger in the wind um, and just whoever, whoever happens to be making the decision and what their, what their knowledge is um, and move to something that's, that's securing, reassuring the public that the services that they need and might need in the future are being planned for and aren't down to some random thanks, thanks very much. making.
Sally Gosling, briefly. Um, I mean, I think just to add to what colleagues have said, I, I think it is a, a, a very valid question as to whether legislation is what's needed or is what can achieve what's, I think, in the spirit of, of the bill. Um, I think what seems to be missing from, from the bill as it's couched is accountability. But I think, obviously, if there is going to be stronger accountability for ensuring safe, effective staffing levels to, to deliver safe, effective care to patients, then obviously that has to be predicated on um, approaches that are robust and um, integrated in their approach, strategic in their approach, and uh, about the whole system, not about one part of the workforce. Okay. So I think that would Thank you. I think it's multi-layered um, in terms of is it Thank the right thing to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alice Colhampton. Thank you, Good morning to the panel. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to pick up on the discussion about um, the impact this has on integration. Um, we did a lot of work as a committee on the integration agenda, and we had an inquiry in that uh, in, in the last year. Um, I, I've always had a niggle since this bill was introduced that this was actually kind of um, going to fly in the face of the good work we've been doing through integration, that it creates a silo, that this is... Uh, that primary care somehow gets a different set of rules and, and is in considered in a um, more focused way than AHPs and social care and all the other sort of arms of integration. Um, can you just explore um, whether we could remedy that in this bill by the inclusion of AHPs and social care provision within, uh, within its pages, or do we just need to tear this up and start again? Very good question. Who would like to answer? Does this bill provide a platform or is it going in the wrong direction? Kim Hartley Keane. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you um, for the question. Um, I, first of all, the HPs are working across health and, and social care. Um, I think the, the general principles, if they were extended to cover outcomes, but I think the it, it could it can create a foundation but i would what the specifics of i would remove that list of tools um and set up as uh, sally's been talking about a strategic way of continuously improving the way that we're planning for staff um in in a way that reflects the evidence base and new models so, yeah, I think it's a foundation, but it, it needs to be radically changed. I think it would be a shame... Well, hearing what my colleague Patricia is saying about not wanting, you know, not having legislation at all, um, there's... I, I do think that um, the, bill, the bill could be significantly improved um, rather than chucking it out altogether. Patricia <laughs> I, th I think it's helpful to think of the origin of the bill, and it was around nursing, a uniprofessional model, and is to be lauded for that in its aims to secure um, safe staffing across all care groups in, in the NHS. And I know my colleague, nurse director in NHS Forth Valley, is a is a real supporter of this this bill. So I, th I think it was a chain that started on a journey and integration has happened and we've joined that journey. The tool began being developed about 10 years ago, which was before the current integration and current health and social care policy. I think in an ideal world, we would be starting from the other end of the telescope and visioning actually what are our workforce needs? What services do we want to provide <coughs> across health and social care? And what is the skill mix that we need and you know across low level to very high end level and provide a balance across that system and then look at actually how do we move from where we are now to a point where we have that blended multidisciplinary workforce um, that that would be obviously we're not in an ideal world but that would be one way of coming at this solution but not at the cost of <clears throat> nursing colleagues who've worked long and hard on this tool and it just feels because it's extended it's it's raising a whole raise of questions at this committee today um i think just to add to what colleagues have said i think um i would agree it feels an odd place to start or it seems an odd um contribution to delivering on 
Scottish Health and Social Care Policy to introduce this bill as, as it's framed. I think it would be helpful to perhaps take stock of the available evidence around what does work and what may have an impact that possibly isn't intended when legislation in good faith is introduced. So I think some of the sort of perverse um, impacts of other legislation should be very carefully evaluated, taking account of they will be about other different different types of healthcare system. But for example, the exa uh, I think the case I highlighted in my introduction did show that um, the introduction of that legislation led to more reliance on nurse agency staff um, rather than increasing nurse capacity. It reduced opportunities for nurse staff to exercise professional judgment in making decisions, um, and it led to some services simply deciding to um, incur the, the penalty fee for not complying with the legislation, none of which was obviously intended by the legislation's introduction. So I think taking very strong account of what the unintended consequences of the legislation could be would be really important to look at, as well as the changed context of what, what's trying to be achieved and will the legislation contribute to it, recognising, as, as colleagues have said, everything that has been done, specifically in nursing, but the risks are that maybe that model is outdated, as, as nursing staff have seemed to reflect it in the, the survey results. So I think it needs a quite a thorough review to make sure it's not um, going in the wrong direction. Thank you, Convener. On the back of that, then, um, you all work, or your professions all work cheek by jowl with uh, the nursing profession, just in terms of integration and what you do in, in around hospitals and other care settings. Um, taken in isolation, does this bill uh, achieve what it set out to do, um, and is it needed? I think on the back of our last set of questions, you may be able to give very brief answers to this one. If you have a tiny follow-up, I like this is the uh, moment for it. As well. Um, we, we learned this morning about a horrific case in, in NHS Highland about a gentleman who's had his social care package removed and um, being paralysed from the neck down. He's been waiting for that for months. And that's symptomatic of um, problems right across the health service. Um, should, should we be using our legislative time to tinker with something that isn't badly broken already in terms of the nursing profession? Or should we be bringing legislation which overhauls our approach to social care? It's not, it's not actually a little question, is it? <laughs> if, I, if, if any of the witnesses wish to respond to that, that very broad question, then feel free. Uh, I, <laughs> I think, um, is your, in, in answer to your question, is it needed? Um, it, is, it is broken at the moment. Um, so, yes, we do need massive improvement in the way that we're planning our workforce um, and I suppose the one, two and three workforce plans would indicate there's quite a lot of work to be done um, and um, yeah, it, it's, I, think, I think it is needed, yeah. And, uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, Ryan Whipple. Thank you, Davina. Good morning. Uh, panel, certainly a lot of information flowing in this general direction and uh, that we need to try and gather together. I specifically wanted to talk about um, uh, multidisciplinary working, which seems to be a theme that consistently comes up in every uh, every time we take evidence, this idea of multidisciplinary working and how this bill could uh, uh, could impact positively or, or, or negatively indeed on that. And if I could drill down uh, further into the role of uh, sort of allied healthcare professionals within uh, sort of multidisciplinary groups, specifically along the distinctive role of AHPs in health and health and social care, and uh, and crucially perhaps bridging uh, the role between those two sectors. And and I think what I'm 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 really interested in is the preventative agenda and how AHPs play into that preventable agenda. For example, uh, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, there's 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 much less unnecessary emissions into hospitals. For an example. Well, I, I can talk from in detail about my the, the profession that I uh, my own profession, which is speech and language therapy, um, and I hope my the HP colleagues I'm representing will will forgive me for talking in detail because that's what I know most about, and I'm sure Sally will talk about um, physiotherapists. But um, uh, everybody who has dementia, um, or everyone who, or and a third of people have had a stroke. Um, but let's talk about people with dementia, 
everyone there will have an eating, drinking and swallowing difficulty at some stage in the progress of their disease. Um, and um, that's one of the earliest things that happen if you have dementia is that your ability to swallow safely is impaired and so you cough and choke and you eventually ask and you'll start aspirating and you get chest infections and you get pneumonia and one of and and so what speech and language therapists do working with um with the individual with the um with the spouse with the home care staff wherever the person is um is is assess where the swallow is going wrong um, again, in in partnership with radiographers and doctors and um, the screening and monitoring that's done by our nursing colleagues as well, and we'll make recommendations about how to safely eat and swallow so the person's not choking, choking and aspirating and not needing to be admitted to hospital. So that's that's one one example from uh, from speech and language therapy, um, which would prevent people being undernourished, um, having unpleasant traumatic experiences every time you try and eat and drink and uh, and being admitted to hospital and having to have a lot of medication but going on I mean, just to add um, to that certainly a key development in physiotherapy at the moment across the UK is um, physiotherapists playing a much stronger role in delivering care within primary care or general practice uh, settings um, particularly to address mus musculoskeletal um, disorders and I think the growing evidence around that is that that um, frontline uh, first point of contact role is really helping to um, ensure more timely care for, for, for individuals to avoid um, issues becoming worse before they're, they're, the individual gains any treatment and reducing both unnecessary referrals to hospital but also um, admission to hospital etc or unnecessary um, tests and uh, medications so I think there's real uh, and also very much um, developing and supporting patient self-management. So I think there's lots of um, potential, as, as Kim said, within each of the allied health professions to really build on that um, prevention, um, more timely, closer to, care, uh, closer to home care for patients that keeps people out of hospital where they don't need to be in hospital. Um, and I think those kinds of service delivery, service improvement models are at risk of not being... Um, progressed through this kind of legislation because the risk, as we've talked about, is that it's predicated on old models of service delivery and obviously um, isn't capturing the multidisciplinary team. So what we need to be doing is looking more at, in this instance, how primary care teams genuinely work collaboratively in patients' best interests uh, and service interests as well, but also um, how workforce development is progressed to meet those changing service delivery model needs. So again, I think those kinds of issues of integration and, and more of a more strategic approach to meeting changing population patient needs are at risk of not being addressed by, as um, Patricia highlighted at the start, quite rigid approaches. Just to <coughs> build on the theme around dementia, so if we have a person at home with dementia working with speech and language therapists, physiotherapists, community psychiatric nurses, we can really improve the level of care that we're able to provide and the consistency of that care through joint planning and joint communication. Also, if we have someone who's been cared for in a care home, it's really important that staff in that care home are really aware of the level of care and that it's required. And again, community psychiatry can be really helpful in coming in and giving training to how to cope with that particular patient's or um, service user's manifestation of their illness and how to actually de-escalate situations and, and work around and retain the consistency that that, that individual may require. So it's very much about looking at how we can blend and work together instead of having layers of services going in to meet needs, actually being really clear and agreed what is the need that that person has at this point in time and who's best to coordinate that, but who's best to deliver it. And people will come in and out of that care delivery package, but there'll be a joint and shared assessment and multidisciplinary discussions about that patient's progress or otherwise. It's really key that we're able to keep people 
in care homes or at home if that's where they want to be and to avoid unnecessary hospital admissions. So, f f for example, if colleagues providing care homes are really challenged about providing nursing care, how can we go in through district nurses and others to provide that care to keep that person in the care home if they're at end of life, if that's where they want to be and they, what they ought to be in a homely setting? of their choice. So it's very much about blending and planning around the person, but doing that not in a siloed way, in a, in a shared a shared space. And, and just to point out that occupational therapists are the group of allied professionals who are currently directly employed in social care, as well as in the healthcare setting. Thank you. So follow, following on with that, what we're, where we should be starting then is quality of care into quality of, quality of life really. so if, if I look at the uh, the the idea then that, that who should be leading then in this sort of methodology who should be involved uh, in, in the development of the bill I mean, as it currently stands just now it, the bill the states that care inspector it will lead on the development of new methodologies for social care and that healthcare improvement Scotland will lead on any new healthcare tools to, to my mind that 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 that, that has, there's a danger there of a divergence uh, of the development in the, within this bill. Is, is that something you would share? I would be concerned about that because in the integration space and provided integrated care, mm. it's about how we plan that together and how we plan the workforce together. It's key to our success, I would say, in cutting across. You know, people don't. As people are care that they are getting high quality responsive services. They don't necessarily care that someone is wearing a uniform from a, an external provider or the council or whoever. They want to know that the team working with them is working together and, and are able to meet their needs. So you don't get a situation where um, there's no conversation you know, if district nurses are going in and carers are going in, that actually they are speaking together and they're planning the care. And that's what integration can provide through having integrated teams where they're speaking to each other on a daily basis. They're working together. They're jointly planning and assessing and adjusting that care when it's required and pulling in other professionals if that's required as well. Because previously, care workers and social workers, quite often the GP is the point of entry. So you'd have to go back and refer to a GP to get access to a service. That takes up a lot of GP time. And actually, when we establish that shared understanding of professionals and limitations and responsibilities, it can take a lot of the obstacles out of the way of delivering really responsive care in a timely manner. Much. Kim uh, Hartley-Kim. In our, in our uh, submission, um, the, the HP Federation were suggesting um, that his was given equivalent equivalent role to Skizwiz, if I could use that um, uh, acronym, um, and we thought and we felt that that would offer the potential for consistency um, of integrated planning across health and social care. There's something about that equivalence and making sure that they're working together, as Patricia, as Patricia described, um, being um, innovative and transformative in the way that across those two two agencies were, were planning uh, planning services and beyond those statutory sectors as well. The integrated joint boards obviously have clear relationships with um, service user forums and the third sector, so it, it would offer opportunities for much better integration as well. So yeah, I, I think that would be good to use, to have for the bill to, to, prov to enable and facilitate that joint working. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's been really interesting hearing all the uh, discussions so far, and a lot of it has focused around allied health professionals. Um, the Welsh bill that was passed focused only on acute care, medical and surgical. So this bill proposes to take that even further, to go to the community as well. And um, for me, as my background's 30 years of nursing, and when we look at the, the guiding principles that are actually stated in the bill, it says that the main purpose of staffing for health and care and care services is to provide safe and high quality services. And that is so far consistent with the main purpose, staffing for health care and care services to be arranged. And it goes on to talk about service users and needs and abilities and all of that. So, 
yesterday I had a conversation about an upside down triangle and the top, the broad part was the health and social care, it was the care provided in the community and the pointy bit at the bottom was acute care which is where you know, some of the care is delivered but most of the care should be in the community and delivered so I think the bill really needs to be really um, good at focusing on the differences in community which requires allied health professional input and I agree we shouldn't be working in silos that the health and social care or the bill has come about after 10 years of implementing tools and we're seeing a patchy approach to the way the tools are accessed and used and all across uh, the, the whole health and um, health care in the NHS even so doesn't the bill support a better training and enablement of the use of tools and the professional judgment tool and the quality tool would be used as part of that to then feed in to allied health professionals contribution to whatever you know whatever we look at as best way to staff and plan our workload Kim Hartley -Keen. Uh, in the short answers uh, no it doesn't feel like that's going to happen and if we look at what's happening already around um, attention to the needs of AHP service users um, we wouldn't be confident that there would be some kind of hoped for trickle down effect um, if that's if that's if that's what you're meaning I think I think what's really important to point out is that AHP's work for in acute in all those service in both acute and and community and community provision um, I think of course it will allow, allow the bill as it stands would allow training and enabling use of tools those specific tools for those specific staff groups um, I suppose uh, well Patricia's already uh, uh, your own the survey that's been published um, on how they're used and the patchy use the patchy use might indicate that this lack of training which is I think one of the messages but it might also just indicate that the tools aren't any good you know that we don't use to you know we all know that we we all got a kitchen drawer full of bits and pieces, tools. We only use the ones that work. And I mean, I'm not meaning to be flippant here, but it's, it's what's those, are those the right tools? Um, and, and I think, and, and Sally's made it clear that there isn't the evaluation of those tools. And in fact, none of us can tell what these, how good those tools are because they're not publicly available to anyone. We can't, no, the CSP's worked hard to try and find them and, and get hold of them, and we can't. So you're in danger of putting something in legislation that nobody knows really what they are. Um. I, mean, I think to add to um, what Kim said, I mean, I think, um, as you say, it's possible to see the, the Scottish Bill as progress from the, the Wales legislation from the point of view that it, it isn't just focused on nursing in acute adult inpatient wards um, and as you would expect we did have and we continue to have concerns about the impact of that in terms of again the the risks of resources being uh, staffing resources being um, focused on meeting the legislation and again not in line with with the direction of health and social care policy so I think it, it's progress from that point of view but I think the tools that we understand underpin the legislation are predominantly acute focused and I think the feedback that again was gained through the survey results was that nurses who are currently using them found them particularly limited for those who are relating to community-based service delivery um, and didn't seem to have a huge amount of confidence in them um, but as I say we're, we're not aware that an evaluation has been undertaken of them I think we would as, as Kim said we would want to um, if the legislation were to be progressed, we would want to have some direct involvement as, as AHP professional bodies in how that's done, given the work that we have done around safe and effective staffing levels and diff quite a thorough appraisal of different approaches. So we feel we've got a lot to add to how it could be done differently that would be in line with uh, a whole system approach and, and could add certainly to a multidisciplinary approach. So I think we would be sceptical at the moment about the, the, the starting points um, as, as couched in the legislation. Patricia Castillo. Yeah. Can I just add, <coughs> just for the avoidance of doubt, there is no evidence base that these tools will work across health and social care. 
There's no evidence base applied to other professions, like social work, social care provision, that it will work. Um, and we need a, a more thorough evaluation of the success and the evidence base for it within nursing but also the impact. We need to be sure that the impact of any legislative tool is to improve outcomes for people who require our care and support services. And I, I would want to finish on that. I think, um, as far as I'm aware, the tools are being revised because they have been used or not used, and there obviously needs to be further education to implement their use. The tools have been developed by the specialty clinicians involved in the specialty areas like community, mental health, maternity. So I would agree that evidence is where the basis of any formation of legislation needs to be obviously the, the number one priority. So I would look forward to clearer evidence if it's not out there to make sure that if we are supporting any legislation or changing it and for me including allied health professionals especially out there in the, the community needs to be part of the legislation going forward because we're seeing that the allied health professional teams are working together with nurses in the community and need to be considered as part of this legislation going forward i see i see assent from all of the witnesses evidence first i think is what is being said uh, finally miles briggs Thank you. I wanted to, to carry on the point Emma Harper's just made and Brian Whittle's point about capturing quality, um, because I think that's one thing we've kind of lost. And I wondered, you know, at this point in time, how, without the tools, are you doing that, especially in a community care setting? We're, we're being told that it's, the idea is to have two speeds um, for this bill. So I wondered, in terms of your work at this moment in time, to capture quality and outcomes and, and then that impact, um, where you've you're doing that without tools at this moment in time. Kim Hartley, Kim. Um, uh, no, we're not doing it without tools. Um, the, the, it's been left up to the professional bodies, or obviously we're here for people that use our services who want to provide the very best um, provision possible and so um, I know my own professional body and I, and I would have thought all the other health, um, a number of the other health professional bodies will like us have developed outcome measurement tools um, tested those that have been tested um, across the UK and um, we've set up um, uh, we've set up a platform where um, speech and language therapy services can record and report the outcomes that they deliver. Um, therapy outcome measures are a common tool um, that uh, people use and we've adapted those in order for all our speech and language therapy services to, to report. And one of the one of the things that obviously rightly um, all AHP leaders have to do is to make the case for for investment in AHP services and they will be using the data developed through those outcome measurement tools to make that case and that is why we that's one of the main drivers we need to create a case based on outcomes so yeah there, there are outcomes there I don't know if you want to okay um Sally Gosling I mean I think to add to that I think it Obviously, as we've said um, throughout, our key focus is on the quality of, of patient outcomes. And as, as Kim said, AHPs do use um, tools to appraise and evaluate and demonstrate the, the quality of their, their outcomes for patients. Um, and as we was going back to the example I cited earlier around um, physio roles in primary care relating to um, musculoskeletal um, conditions, we, we are undertaking um, with other key stakeholders a thorough evaluation of the impact of that, that new model of first contact practitioners. So I think it's a very strong focus for professional bodies in, in taking forward service improvements for patients in terms of demonstrating their value and impact. I suppose for me it comes back to as currently couched, I would see the legislation is focused much more on issues of input and activity rather than of, of staff, rather than a focus on quality of outcomes or quality of experience potentially for patients. So I think we're talking about different aspects of quality, and it's how we 
seek to ensure that the legislation is focused on quality of patient experience and outcomes, not on inputs and activity, which I think traditionally staffing level tools have tended to do. And again, we've done work to, to shift that to focus much more on, on patient outcomes, not on inputs, tasks, activity, etc. Patricia Cast. Um, <coughs> the current legislative framework um, for social care, it comes under Regulation 15 of the Social Care and Social Work Improvement Scotland 2011, and that has regulations and a scrutiny framework. The care inspectorate inspect all of the services that are provided um, and the new health and social care standards that came in this year are a key focus of that inspection and very much focus on outcomes, particularly outcome three. I have confidence with the people who are providing my support and care. Um, care homes began to be inspected against the health and social care standards in July of this year. So that is a, a whole new um, filter through which it's very much about looking at outcomes focused at a more local level across the multidisciplinary teams. There are a range of outcome measures. People's person-centred plans are developed on their personal outcomes and with their carers. We're required under the Carers Act to do planning with carers as well. So there's a whole range of checks and balances that are in place to measure outcomes and safety and quality across the services. Thank you very much. And can I thank all of our witnesses uh, on this panel for very informative contributions and for answering a wide range of questions uh, uh, and, of course, for your initial written submissions. We'll now take a short break and resume at 11.50 with our second witness panel. Thank you very much.
we will uh, resume our evidence session on the Health and Care, Care Scotland Bill, uh, Staffing Scotland Bill, with uh, our second evidence witness panel. Uh, can I welcome to the committee Rachel Cackett, the Policy Advisor of the Royal College of Nursing Scotland, Dr Mary Ross Davy, uh, Director of Scotland, the Royal College of Midwives, Dr David Chung, uh, Vice President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine in Scotland, Professor Alec McMahon, Executive Nurse Director, NHS Lothian, representing the Scottish Executive Nurse Directors Group, and uh, David MacArthur, Director of Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Professionals, NHS Orkney. Welcome uh, to you all to the committee this morning. As you may know, we've heard already some extensive formal evidence uh, in relation to uh, health and social care and in relation to allied health professionals. And we have also taken informal evidence from many of those responsible for uh, the tools which are a focal part of the bill. Could I perhaps ask each of the witnesses to comment briefly on your overall view uh, of the bill and what it uh, brings to the objectives in health and in social care? Perhaps starting with Rachel Cackett. Happily, and thank you for the opportunity. It's been a, an interesting morning. I'm sure there'll be a lot to build on from the discussions that we've already heard. The Royal College of Nursing has put extensive evidence in and been working on trying to develop this bill with the government and now through the parliamentary process for the past 12 months plus. And the first thing I guess I would say, and we heard a little bit this morning, is how far the bill has moved from where it began, which was simply to legislate, to put tools onto, the, onto legislation, and, and that was going to be it. And I, I think it's important to note how far this has gone and how complex the bill is now, um, and how there is still work to be done. The areas, really, that the six areas that the RCN is particularly keen to see this bill improve around. The first, and we've heard a lot about this already this morning, is that the bill must be rooted in positive outcomes for patients and for staff. Because if we have an overstretched staff <coughs> workforce, then there's simply those, those members of staff who go the extra mile every single day will struggle. And that is the situation we were in now. And I, and I guess coming back to the question that was asked to the first round of, of people giving evidence was why do we need this bill? Well, that's it. That's certainly the reason. There is clear evidence about the link between patient outcomes and nursing staff. And we would certainly be happy to, to provide some of that to the committee if that would help. There is work to be done in the bill to increase the level of a strong professional voice. And I do use the word professional voice. I'm here speaking for the Royal College of Nursing and our remit and mandate is for nursing. And it is important for us that nursing has a voice right through all elements of this bill as we would hope to see it um, by the time it completes its parliamentary passage. That does not mean we are trying to exclude other professions. That is the mandate that we have to speak to. It's important that in decision making around staffing is informed. And that does mean using the best available evidence that we have and the best available data. Now, obviously, the bill at the moment, in terms of the common staffing method, limits itself to emergency medicine as the one multidisciplinary tool, <coughs> nursing and midwifery. The RCN is clear that we have spent a lot of time in, this, in Scotland developing a series of tools for a workforce that is the largest workforce in the NHS, delivering 24-7 clinical care, often high-risk clinical care. And I think we have to be aware of the patient safety elements that this bill affords us the opportunity to address. However, that doesn't mean that those tools are in ASPIC. They really aren't set in ASPIC, and it's never been our position. There was mention made at the end of the last session that those tools are being reviewed at, at this time. And even for us, not all elements of nursing are currently included in the available tools. Prison nursing, for example, an area that we've done a lot of work, does not currently have a tool attached to it. So we would like to see that starting point, that evidence, developed, both for nursing and for others but we certainly would not wish to see what we have dropped because I think that would be a retrograde step. I think Kim used a very helpful uh, phrase of, uh, of not wanting to put a wet finger in the air and I think what the tools give us is a starting point for a significant part of the workforce to do that with the opportunity to learn and develop more. And I think the bill would have been helped had those uh, provisions for how those methodologies would be developed in the future appeared clearly on the face of the bill, and we would certainly seek for that to be the case, and had the financial memorandum made a greater timed commitment to the extension of those tools both for nursing and for our colleagues. We want to see responsibility, accountability, real-time action and long-term planning a part of the bill. 
And I think the paper that was shared last night from the, the government was helpful and I think clearly sets out um, where there are areas for development. The common staffing method as it stands, in our view, is a means for setting establishment and it goes beyond the tools as they currently stand to include far more data around how professional judgment will inform that establishment. What it doesn't do and what our members need to see it to do and what patients should be expecting to see it do is deal with real-time risk. You turn up on shift and you do not have enough staff to deliver all the right staff to deliver the care that is required. What then happens? We've provided in our evidence a schematic for how we think that could be better dealt with. And um, my understanding is that the government's thinking is that will go forward linked to the general duty. And we must remember the general duty to provide appropriate staffing is for all staff and not just for nursing, midwifery and emergency medicine. There is no scrutiny and sanction on the face of the bill, and we would like to see that added. We don't want another 12-week referral to treatment target put into legislation where you can breach it as many times as you like and it makes no difference whatsoever. This has to have teeth. This is a crucial patient safety issue, and we need to make sure that there is accountability in the right place. And one of the issues in the bill is that at the moment, where we're talking about part two, focused on the NHS, there is accountability put onto boards for delivering the general duty, and that is important, but it needs to be linked to a scrutiny <coughs> methodology, and there's a great opportunity that his are now reviewing how they do that to include that. But there also needs to be the opportunity for public scrutiny, either where things are repeatedly going wrong or where something very serious has happened. We need to make sure that staff on the ground are enabled to do that in real time, and that Parliament <coughs> and others have a role in doing that over the longer term. And finally, we need to make sure that there are actually enough staff to care. Senior charge nurses, I know you've been speaking to many this morning, are crucial to this as a process. They are there to set the culture for their team, to supervise the work of their team, to set staffing, to deal with risk. If we do not free up our senior charge nurses and their equivalents in the community, this bill cannot do what we expect it to do. It's utterly important, and it comes back from your survey, that they do not currently have the time to do what they need to do. And so we are seeking that this bill make senior charge nurses and their equivalents in the community non-caseload holding, so that they are freed up from direct patient care to be able to supervise the work of their teams and ensure that that is safe. But we also need to make sure that there is supply dealt with, and this doesn't deal with supply. We cannot tie the hands of boards to put a duty on them to provide appropriate staffing if actually the supply, which is held, uh, uh, held by Scottish Government, doesn't come through. So we would like to see that added. We appreciate part three is complex because of the landscape it's working in, but our interest in that is for our clinical nurses providing clinical care in the care home sector, and our stance is that you shouldn't expect any different in terms of the clinical care you re receive, whether that's in a care home, in your own home, or in a hospital. And that's why we have supported part three. Thank you very much. Mary Ross Davy. Thank you. Uh, so the Royal College of Midwives uh, believe this legislation may be helpful in establishing a consistent strategic focus on the staffing of maternity services. Uh, we've been grateful for the great focus that our uh, sister organisation, Royal College of Nurse Nursing, uh, have given uh, to this legislation. Uh, and we've been working alongside them uh, to uh, affect change in, in the nature of the bill. Uh, and also to support the developments that are needed to ensure that the planning tools are fit for purpose. I'm sure you'll have heard from uh, some of my colleagues this morning uh, that the midwifery planning tool uh, that's in existence at the moment uh, does have some uh, weaknesses and there are some issues uh, in terms of uh, how effectively they have been implemented. That is a bit patchy. Um, but what we recognise is that through the preparations that have been underway for the introduction of the bill, that has led to greater focus on the need to amend and develop the midwifery workforce planning tool, and also to increase the support being provided in health boards to successfully run the tools. Um, the bill is just part of a much wider picture in ensuring that we have safe staffing levels and that we have midwives in all parts of Scotland. We have particular challenges in recruiting and retaining midwives, particularly in the north of Scotland and in more remote and rural areas. Uh, and there are a whole raft of other uh, supports and changes that are needed in addition uh, to the bill. 
You'll know from the SPICE staff survey, sur survey undertaken earlier this year and also from our consultations with our members that there are a range of problems with the current midwifery workforce planning tool. Uh, I apologise for not having tabled uh, a paper before today, but I have copies for you today that just summarise some of those challenges that have been identified. There are some areas in Scotland that have invested significant time and energy into providing dedicated time for completion of the tool and training. And in those areas, there have been instances where a staff shortfall has been identified and then business case was able to be made for more midwifery staff. Uh, we acknowledge the significant amount of national activity that is now underway to ensure that state staff are trained to use the tool effectively and giving ongoing support. Thank you very much. Uh, David John. Thank you. Um, Royal College of Emergency Medicine is broadly supportive of the principles behind the bill. So the speakers have said, I think it's quite important to have some oversight and an integrated planning of the health and social care system within Scotland. And the bill acknowledges this. And I think it's quite important because what we're really looking at, we have an unofficial motto, which is if it's right for the patient, it's right for the emergency department. Many of the things that we see, we're the interface between different parts of social care and primary care, secondary care and health. So we get to see things quite quickly and we get to see where there are issues, they become manifest in us more acutely than other areas. And most of the things where we feel the patients might be getting a raw deal, such as if they're waiting for a long time in trolleys in a department trying to get into a bed or to go somewhere to be rapidly processed and, and have their needs met, whether it be clinics or whatever, are due to the fact that there may well be staffing issues elsewhere in the system. So whilst we welcome that there is an emphasis on multidisciplinary care within emergency medicine, it's also quite important that there's an emphasis on care out with the emergency department because staffing levels there need to be adequate for the whole process to run smoothly. And we, as I've often said before, are kind of the sort of the canary in the mine or for younger people who can't remember that, the you know indicator light on a dashboard telling you've got a problem in your engine. So that, that in itself is good. As other people have said, I think we need to accept that the concept of the bill, whilst sound, needs to be accepted. It's going to be an iterative process and there needs to be feedback available um, from clinicians of all stripes to say if they find that the bits of the bill aren't workable or, or the actual tools are not <coughs> providing or there's a weakness. There's a, an ability and a capacity to, to rectify that as soon as you can. It's the same with any sort of process, whether it be health, social care, industry. If people feel like it's making a mistake, we need to be able to correct that because there's no point doing the same thing incorrectly just because it's been set in legislation. Um, I think one of the things we'd, we'd say is it's important as well that in terms of data recording or things, is transparency is quite important. So we, when the bill comes in and various organisations are going to be showing how they've, they've implemented the tools and reached reach levels of staffing, that, that entire process should be in the public domain, um, which I'm not sure if the bill makes quite explicit, but I think would be important um, because let's say at the end of the day, it, it's, it's the taxpayer's money, but also it has been able, been able to be say it's a transparent and it's, and it's uh, open to scrutiny. So in short, can answer another direct questions, but we'd be broadly supportive. I think it's very, it need, needs, again, this should be something that helps speed and provide greater impetus to true integration of health and social care, which whilst we're making some steps, um, could perhaps start to be progressing at a, a slightly more faster pace than it is just now. Um, and uh, as long as we're mindful of that, it's definitely got the potential to benefit patients and staff and improve the human experience of everybody working in health and social care. Thank you very much. Alec McMahon. So just building on some of the comments that colleagues have made, all of which I think I would probably agree with, um, so I don't think anyone would disagree with the principles of the legislation that's been proposed or indeed the aspirations around it in terms of patient safety, but also looking uh, to ensure that we look after the staff that we employ going forward. Um, I think most people would probably agree that the tools as they stand are not perfect, but there is a process of how, how we review those tools and the implementation uh, of those tools. Um, I think that also brings to bear the infrastructure that we previously not had in the past that would support the running of the tools, the analysis of the tools, and then the implementation of the finding of the tools as well. So these are things that we obviously want to address um, with government and others going forward. Um, I think the principle of this is also about how do we work in partnership 
between health boards, councils and integration joint bodies. Um, there is a process already in place around workforce planning. We need to build on that planning process to ensure not just from a nursing perspective. So as I sit here, I'm also responsible for AHPs in Lothian. So I have a duty at the executive level to ensure that the voice of AHPs is heard at a workforce planning level and the professional uh, level as well. So I do want to see the tools as they progress becoming much more dis multidisciplinary because we need to ensure that patients get access to the right staff, and that's across the spectrum, not just within the nursing perspective as well. I guess the other point I would make is that in terms of process around escalation, that it's really important to look at that from a public scrutiny point of view, but that it must not become bureaucratic and interfere with day-to-day -day business within health boards. OK, thank you very much. David MacArthur. Chair, thank you very much. It may be worthwhile to give a, 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 um, an outline of scale of NHS Orkney as the smallest health board in, in, in Scotland. Uh, where we have, uh, in terms of headcount, uh, our AHPs, we have uh, principally some of 40. Uh, our community nurse headcount in whole term equivalents is 62. And our hospital nursing headcount in terms of WTE is 135. So although we're not talking about huge numbers here, when we start to apply the staffing tools, we do, we do come into challenges in terms of our lack of resilience. Uh, we, our bank, for example, are wholly employed by our, uh, by, within the board already. Uh, so there's very few, there's no spare capacity. So we tend to staff up in terms of, uh, of working towards worst case scenario. So the tools, in, in fact, will be helpful for us in as much that they, they will provide transparency. They will hopefully support that, that view, especially in terms of the uh, professional judgment tool. Uh, I would support in, entirely what my colleagues have said already. Uh, this is about transparency. It is about being able to demonstrate that we are doing the right thing, that we have the appropriate amount of staff. Uh, but I think also that within the bill that gives me some degree of concern is the lack of speci specificity in terms of the impact on that remote and rural area. Uh, and it goes back to one of the earlier comments about the Scottish Government being holding that supply. We need that supply coming onto the islands. Uh, we need that flexibility in workforce. So in support of my HP colleagues, uh, I would say that we, we also need to build that very strong uh, multidisciplinary workforce that can perhaps work across barriers and work across professional uh, boundaries. Uh, I think that in terms of the uh, any caveats we have on the in terms of the the bill uh, and workforce tools i see the bill as a huge opportunity it's an opportunity that we can utilize to build that multidisciplinary uh, workforce i think that it gives us an opportunity to ensure that the workforce tools are are utilized properly and one of the issues we have with the workforce tools is that there's a lack of knowledge in their application uh, we need to ensure that that educational piece is out there and where the tools are not working for us uh, as professionals, we need to put our hands up and say that, but also provide a, an answer uh, to, to those questions. OK, thank you very much. Sandra White. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, and, and thank you for your presentations uh, as, as well. Certainly things have changed, as has already been mentioned by, by others. It's, it's certainly moved on, and from what you're saying, I think you, you would like to see it move on and maybe a wee bit more tools on it. But I would just put this uh, particular question to you, which was raised by the previous panel. Uh, they mentioned the fact that um, this bill and, and the tools are acute service based. Now, it can be a quick yes, I agree or not, I don't agree. Uh, if you wish to expand or just uh, mention one or two. Uh, talk from the midwifery perspective. So the original um, research to develop the midwifery workforce planning tool, uh, some of the observations were undertaken apparently in community settings and not just in uh, acute labour ward settings. However, when we speak to colleagues out in the service, they're very clear that they feel that the tool is more effective uh, in the acute setting, in a labour ward setting or the antenatal and postnatal ward, and less so out in community settings. One of the key problems that has arisen is that the community um, elements of the tool only allow for community care to be provided in working hours. 
And obviously not all babies are born out in the community between nine to five, Monday to Friday. So we have a significant number of home births and births in midwife-led units all over the country. And, and there's been real issues in acknowledging that care that's being provided and making sure it's recorded correctly. So that's, that's a key element that is, is currently not well covered in the midwifery workforce planning tool. And, and we're hoping uh, that the, the, the look at this is, is going to um, improve on that. We're particularly concerned as well because uh, the direction that maternity services are going over the next five years with the Best Start review recommendations is definitely towards a more community-based service where midwives, uh, many midwives will move out from working in hospital settings out into the community. And so we need to make sure that the tool is robust uh, and fit for purpose for ensuring that we've got safe staffing levels out in the community, particularly in remote and rural areas where midwives are having to sometimes drive for four hours to undertake, uh, you know, there and back for one postnatal visit. Um, so that all needs to be very much taken into account. And colleagues in remote areas have certainly said that they feel uh, that isn't done effectively at the moment. I think just picking up your question. Um, Many of these tools were developed at a point in time when many of the services we currently deliver weren't being delivered by healthcare professionals. So, for example, prisons has been mentioned, uh, police custody is another area that has been mentioned. Um, only recently we've delegated the responsibility to IGBs for community mental health, learning disability and substance misuse services. So from the point of view of as time is progressing, there is a, a greater need to look at how we're actually providing that care to people in different settings uh, and what the, what the workforce requirements is around those. So there's a much more scrutiny now uh, around that. Um, so we need to rebalance, as it were, some of the tools to ensure that we're taking cognizance of the community elements just as much as we are the, the acute bit. I, I guess for me, it's the point about the, the pathway that patients, patients aren't quite linear. They're just going to one bit of a system. Uh, they, they cover many pathways. So it's making sure there's that synergy and connectedness. So I think in terms of tools that are currently on the face of the bill, they do include community tools. They're not comprehensive. They don't cover all areas of community nursing at this point in time, but they are there. Um, clearly, there's, there's more that sit within specialties within the acute sector, but it's not that they are only for the acute sector, and I think that has to be welcomed. And one of the areas, as we're looking at the review of those tools, which has begun, the Scottish Government have begun that review, is that the type of services that nursing are providing in the community is now very different than it would have been 10 or 12 years ago. The sorts of things you'd have gone into hospital for, you'll now be receiving in the community as we change the way in which we deliver services and new options come, come online. So certainly that, that, that needs work and there are areas of the community that aren't covered. I guess perhaps one of the things I would pick up on that's I think are linked uh, to that in what, we were in what was being discussed with you earlier this morning is around this idea of multidisciplinary and what does that look like particularly in the community. And I think we have to pick that apart a little bit. So I think there's not a single person around this table, um, uh, the RCN included, who would not be absolutely promoting the need for multidisciplinary teams where that is exactly what is required by patients or service users, whether that's in the community or in the acute sector. The team has to be multidisciplinary where that is the right thing to do. However, within that team, when you come down to setting your establishment and understanding your workforce planning, you still have to know how many of each individual profession you require to meet the needs of individual patients. You need to know how many paramedics you need in the back of an ambulance to run an ambulance service. That may or may not be done on a multidisciplinary basis. You need to know how many district nurses, and we were, talking this, we were talking this morning about what those changes might look like in the care home sector, you need to know how many district nurses you need to deliver your multidisciplinary community service. So I think it's really important that we bear in mind that when you're setting establishments, particularly when you're thinking whether that's the number of bodies you've got on the ground on one day or the supply that you are planning for at Scottish Government level, you need to know how many nurses you need. But that doesn't mean that you don't then apply that to a multidisciplinary setting. And often one tool may not be appropriate. So if you're, if you're running a 24-7 a nursing service that may have sessional input from our HP colleagues, for example, I would be surprised if you were using exactly the same tool to try and work out how you have enough physios or OTs compared to enough nurses, but you would be putting that into a multidisciplinary workforce planning process. And I think we have to bear that in mind. That the bill is not necessarily trying to do everything that is being described. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, David Chung. I think it's important to try and lose, in some ways, these distinctions between community and acute. This is part of the problem. So there may well be a need for more staff in the community, 
to, which will ameliorate perhaps, let's say, negative effects on the acute care and vice versa. And we would hope as these tools become better developed with this sort of feedback, it will then be decided that what might the outcome measures be, how can you tell if it's working or not? And if community is only looking to within community or what average level, and, and it's a mistake to use average to plan capacity in any, anything, because it's going to be not enough half of the time, um, should be those kind of, of measures. This is what we're saying we, uh, in support of the principle, but this is what we want to see happening. So we can say, right, okay, is a community tool going to take into account? It's going to enable, let's say, all of the delayed discharges not to occur. It's going to enable people, more importantly, to have assessments at home, like they do in East Ayrshire, and not even get anywhere near a hospital, which is good for them. Is it also going to mean that, let's say, there's enough acute staff that, let's say, we, when you, if there isn't things that patients do need to come to hospital, they, they're going to stay there for the amount of time they need to, as opposed to perhaps go out to the community, then the two sides aren't going to constantly be creating a merry-go-round for patients which they don't need because the capacity isn't right in either. So I really would emphasise whatever tools they can't really afford in the next five to ten years to be seeing themselves as, I'm a community tool, I'm an acute tool. You're all an integrated tool, and that's how the system should be developed. Okay. David MacArthur. Uh, we mentioned earlier on the particular challenges in, in midwifery, uh, where uh, you know, we're in the position at the moment of supporting home births uh, from, from our central base in, in Kirkwall out to, to Papa Westray. So it's either a helicopter uh, or it can be a couple of hour boat ride to get out and, and do that. Uh, that means that while we're waiting for midwife to arrive and we're waiting for, for that work for the, uh, for the team to get there, that there needs to be an ability to, to provide care. And that's where our multidisciplinary piece really needs to come in. So the, the workforce tool, you know, I would agree, it needs to be very much based across that holistic view, that continuity and continuum of care. Uh, otherwise, we will end up siloed and we'll, we'll, lose, the, uh, we'll lose the ability to flex. Uh, and in addition, that also allows the, the IGB, for example, to commission appropriately and to make sure that they, they are providing the correct services. Okay, thank you very much. Sandra? Thank you very much. Um, thank you for, for that answer. It appears to me that uh, the tools as they stand at the moment don't seem to be fit for purpose if you're looking to the future. And I wonder if you would perhaps maybe not agree with me but say something about that. But they're all based basically on SSTS, which is the pay and staffing as well. So therefore, when you're looking at that, it's quite difficult, I think, to look beyond the triangle in the opposite way as was uh, described by my colleague Emma Harper. So how, how do we fix that then? Because I think everyone wants to see this bill work uh, and also obviously for the community as well. But it just seems that are the tools uh, not fit for purpose based on the S SST3? How do we get around that to include you know, other issues? So the SST is simply a system that they are mm -hmm. built in. It's e-payroll. Yes. Um, it is not necessarily fit for purpose um, because there's a lot of entry and duplication of effort for staff to try and triangulate information from that system back into a workforce planning perspective. So there's a piece of work that Scottish Government are leading with NSS to review uh, that and what would a better platform be, an information system be, uh, to support that going forward. So I think there's that one element of it. I think the other elements have been the education, the training, the awareness of the tools and the implementation of those, the outputs from those tools, be that from a de desktop exercise or be it through the actual running it through the e-system, e uh, and actually, more laterally, the capacity, um, uh, the expert capacity in the system to be able to work with people like myself and others to make sure that the outputs from those tools are being interrogated, analysed, and then turned into quite robust plans as well. So I would say all of those elements are being addressed, and, uh, and you know, if we get those right, at the point of this becoming legislation and then enacted, then that would certainly put us in a better playing field to begin with. Uh, yes, I, I'd, I'd reiterate exactly what Alex has said and, and emphasise that <clears throat> when the tools were first established, uh, there was a huge trading uh, effort that went into to support that. And we've seen that cohort of people change and they've moved out. We haven't perhaps kept ourselves up to date as we should have done uh, with the tools, but the tools, as they stand at the moment, provide us with a start point. And I think the direction of travel is, is absolutely correct in the way that the, the tools are coming in. And we also need to be very cognisant of the fact that, that this is also recognised by CNO's office, uh, who has, who has uh, provided us uh, within the boards with uh, an extra resource, an expert resource, both 
from within our office and locally within the boards yet to be recruited, uh, who will provide that continuity and that additional input for us. So I, I would say that, as I said earlier, no one wants to see tools that are set in aspic because the world moves on. And um, it's encouraging that the government have now put in a process to review the tools that we do have. And I think that should be an ongoing review process. We cannot, we cannot let the dust settle on these tools at any point. They have to be fit for purpose. And I think that's why the bill should be amended to include that as a, a, a duty within the bill so that that ongoing method of review is in place. We need to be able to say when a tool has come to the end of its life. We need to be able to say when we need a new tool and we need to keep what we have up to date. And that's a really important process that's currently missing. And whilst in the social care section, his have obviously got the responsibility as it currently stands for developing new methodologies. Again, it doesn't go far enough by saying that they need to be able to keep those up to date and the process for doing that. So I think those are in, in, it really important things that we need to look at to make the bill fit more fit for purpose. And I go back to the point of the survey um, and certainly the discussions that we've been having with our members, which is when you're wanting to run these, you do need the education and you need the time and you need the expertise to do that. So those things also really matter and have to be in place. And we need to look at where the levers are within this legislation to get that right. Thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Yeah, thanking convener is probably a, an appropriate time to, to mention my register of interest here that I have a close family member who's a midwife. Um, I, I actually wanted to follow on from um, Sandra White's line of questioning in terms of the technology. If this bill is going to uh, succeed, um, it's fundamental that technology that underpins it, uh, it, it supports uh, the tools that, uh, that are, are required. And what we've heard in evidence, and we heard again in evidence this morning, is the, the, the wide variety of tools that seem to be, uh, be used by uh, midwives and nurses uh, at, who this morning actually didn't recognise some of the names of the tools that other, uh, other uh, areas were using. So I think with, with the SSTS platform, that, as, as you've mentioned, already mentioned, uh, Professor McMahon, is not built for purpose and therefore is not fit for purpose. Would, would you, are we suggesting here, if we, before this bill can go anywhere, you need a platform that is developed specifically to, to, to deliver on, on this, uh, uh, deliver, and also a, a better regulation of the tools uh, across the profession? So I know that um, NSS is currently uh, looking to procure a new system, uh, and I believe that they would hope to have that by the end of the calendar year. Um, then there's an issue about how that can be then developed and implemented. Um, so one would hope that it could work at the pace at which the legislation is going forward. That might well be in place for, I guess, from that perspective, it's not just about having a system in place. It's about having people trained and educated and able to use that system. So there's a lot of work to be done from that, from that point of view. Um, I, there's also a testing out of systems. I guess not to have a new system in place and then to introduce it after we've introduced this bill just causes more confusion and work for people uh, as well. So I'm not saying that one should stop the other progressing, but it'd be in the ideal world, it'd be nice to see both coming in at the same time. Anyone else? Mary Ross David. I, th I think the introduction of the bill has in itself focused people's minds on what's not working. And um, that's certainly been the case for the midwifery workforce planning tool. I think, you know, then views were sought from the heads midwifery around how effective the tool was. And it was clear that it was it was really quite patchy. And at least half of the health boards were feeling that the tool wasn't uh, reflecting what they needed. So I think... The, the bill in itself, its introduction actually helps move things. And then, you know, the work is well progressed, I understand, with the, um, the new platform. So I think it, it helps in tandem, if you like. I think what we're, what we're hearing and, and, and the information that you got back from the survey shows that it's not a uniform picture. So there are clearly areas where things are working more fluidly than perhaps they are in others. And I think that, that, that that's part of the work that the government is now doing with its additional support. And like you say, it's certainly focused minds within boards and elsewhere to, to rethink how this is implemented. So I would certainly be reluctant to say, let's hold off till everything's perfect, because what we were saying earlier, this is an ongoing improvement process, and it will never stop, and nor should it. That's what the health service is built on, is an improvement focus, as is our social care service. 
So I, I certainly wouldn't say that. I mean, there are other platforms as well that we're looking around the care assurance system that the CNO is developing through excellence in care, which will give really important indicators to us about the quality of care being provided and the outcomes for people. And that is being developed in tandem with this bill, which is a really important point that we shouldn't forget that there are other indicators out there in other platforms, but definitely not. And we have to remember the common staffing method is not just the tools. And I think we lobbied from the RCN very hard for that to be the case, and the government listened. And in terms of setting an establishment, it gives those with professional judgment a whole variety of other means to then come up with what that establishment should be. It's not limited to the tool alone. You will be looking at other things. One of the things we would like to see added, for example, is professional guidance from, from royal colleges or from peer-reviewed international evidence that could be brought in by those who have the professional judgment to make on what an appropriate staffing level would be for any particular setting. Uh, yes, I'll be saying, you know, it's ideally we would see both come together and that, that would be the perfect solution. Uh, but from a previous, previous employment, uh, it was made very clear to me on, on many occasions that we need to, we perhaps need to go with the best current solution that we have, rather than hold hold up the hold the plan, because uh, you're never going to get quite the the, the perfect plan, uh, and is it going to survive first contact? Oh, my man, I think you want to back. What, uh, Rachel was saying, uh, I guess there is a potential to run with systems that actually aren't all necessarily collecting the same data and aren't all defined in the same way. Mm -hmm. So we start to select things as we want to, from bits to try and make the argument that actually what we need, really need here is a like-for-like like apples and apples situation, not situations we might have had in the past about depending which day of the week you run it or depending on which question you ask, you get a different output. This needs absolute clarity and consistency. Thank you very much. Um, Alec Hound. Convener, good morning to the panel. I have one um, quite large narrative question about this, and then a, a couple of detailed questions, perhaps more for those um, dealing with the nursing profession on a day to day basis. Um, do Dr. Chung, I was struck by your canary in the mine reference at the start, and we have met personally, and, and you've described in, in very coherent detail as to how the problem in social care is actually causing an interruption in flow, which is manifest in accident emergency. But you can't release people into the wider hospital because there's no beds to receive them. Are we missing a trick by not including aspects of social care um, within this? And does that cause us problems for the whole integration experiment because it is um, very much siloed and focused on primary care? Well, I, I would say you've basically summed up quite nicely the points I was sort of making. So, yeah, it is essential that social care are involved in this because that's where a lot of the capacity is moving. Again, a lot of this is aimed at what's best for the patient and it will also turn out to be what's best for the staff if the patients are getting the right care. The two have to go hand in hand. So, as I've already kind of uh, indicated, it does need to totally account for integration and the fact that the different parts of the system cannot afford to plan in isolation from one another. They are going to have to work together because there will be effects, hopefully positive, but they could be negative if one bit doesn't get it right. And therefore, whatever tools are developed must, mean, must ensure that the effects of whatever planning occurs in one particular area just now, there's a broader scope and some overview to see, well, it, that's all very well, but is that going to have a negative unintended consequence somewhere else all sorts of planning is littered with this and again if we make the system that it can be rapidly assessed and updated and changed if that appears to be the case then we can change the tool to ensure that doesn't happen so i would i would say yes i agree your, your analysis is correct we do need to have you know it is imperative that all the parts of the system within health and social care emergency medicine it's called emergency medicine but there's a lot of it is actually social medicine in some ways as well people come to us because there are issues within their lives we're available, we're there. We, we're very often not the best place to solve the problems. And increasingly, we're seeing some very good work in Scotland about how we're using other staff groups to help we can signpost people to the right place. You've got, let's say, the navigators in, in, in the big hospitals now, including our own Ayrshire. You've got other things like you know community connectors, adult support and protection. All these are very integrated groups. These can get very much to the, to the root of the problem. You're moving into the likes of paediatrics and, and adverse child events. That's solving the problem for the next 20 years. If you can get to grips with early childhood stuff, we're gonna have less work to do. And, and so the care it is, it, it's quite important. It's very difficult to nail this down to the way the tool is just now because it's very easy to look at a defined group. 
but as it develops, it needs to become sophisticated to reflect all these, to see where does the system need, you're going to get most bang for its buck for the patient's benefit and for value for money for the taxpayer. Okay, anybody else on that? Okay, so thank you very much for that. that that's great. Um, the second is a bit more detailed. It's about um, the, obviously within the, the toolkit and, and the other sort of provisions in the bill, uh, it's clear that this is about uh, better workforce planning. Uh, but we, we have in our background briefing, I've been struck by the, the focus on things like headcount and being sure that we have capacity, but it's not always necessarily clear whether that's the right capacity. And should we be specifying the need for appropriate skills mix within the, the staffing that we are planning for? Um, we'll take Rachel first, then David, then Alex. So I think a few things to answer to that. First is that the duty to provide appropriate staffing is very clear that they need to be competent and qualified to do that. And I think that's the way in which the bill is attempting to deal with the issue of skills mix. So within the nursing tools as they currently stand, the tool itself is not going to give you a skill mix. It'll give you a number. And it is for the average workload. So it gives you a baseline and the professional judgment is then applied to work out what that should look like. And I think the, the bill as it's currently drafted, because of the way the common staffing method is written, goes back to an earlier point, which it does give you essentially a focus on a, a number um, for that average workload based on a certain set of assumptions like bed occupancy, which may be well off where bed occupancy is in the current situation for the NHS in Scotland. What it doesn't do is deal with risk and that's the big bit that's missing in, in the bill for, for, for us, I mean, along with some of the other things I, I, I set out earlier. But the, the risk management process you can have a number, you can have a skill mix, but if you have a sudden outbreak of flu that's affecting both your staff group and the acuity of the patients coming to you, you need to be able to adjust that and do ongoing risk assessment. So I think only part of this is about an evidence-based number, which you do need for workforce planning and you do need to get your finance right. But you need to have the professional judgment in place with the support for that to be consistently, every single day, adjusting that according to patient need whether that's in the community or in the acute sector. And is there sufficient provision for that within the bill? No, that's it needs to be added. And I know the government is obviously looking at work to do that, and we won't see the, exactly what that looks like, obviously, for, for a while yet, but there are discussions going on. But we've obviously put forward proposals as well as to how that could look. And I think in terms of our members, that would address many of their concerns, which is about find, set a number and get your budget right for your establishment. That's an important process, and it needs to be based on the best available evidence, which is why we need the tools as part of that but also you need to be able to deal with risk in real time. David Chung. Um, it's um, like all issues, this tends to get more complex the more you look at it, which then is just one of those things, it's life, isn't it? So I'd say the points made about using an average to plan capacity is a fool's errand um, because by the law of averages, you're not gonna have enough half of the time. So there are certain ways to plan. You could, you know, the perfectionist would say, we need to be able to cope with having enough reserve to have 90, you know, plan for 95% of what there is. That's probably not far off, or 85% maybe is, is perhaps a minimum. But I would certainly say using the average is, is going to cause problems because it's then not going to work. People are going to be unhappy half the time, you're going to lose engagement. So there needs to be some modification around that. Um, again, headcount in as of itself is a wee bit too crude because there are differences in skill mix. The differences in, in time, time of day days of the week, seasons of the year, all of these may create different pressures. So <coughs> the way things are, most tools and most workforce planning appears to have said, well, you, you, historically, the, the viewpoint is mainly, we've got this amount of staff, how can we divide them up to put them where we need to be? Perhaps it needs to be some work about how many staff do we actually need, and the Royal College can certainly give some you know, help with that. If you look at national benchmarks, should we say, well, what kind of health service model are we aiming for? If you look at, let's say, somewhere like Australia, they've got about maybe not quite double, but certainly 78% more beds, more doctors, probably more nurses as well. Or, or do you want to, we are currently at about the same level as the US compared to our European neighbours. We're less than all these, and I've got the figures here because I remember I mentioned this last time and was asked, but I've, I've got them to hand. So you could say, is your tool going to reflect the fact that you're going to need a certain amount of different staff, let's say on a Monday evening, which is the busiest time in the emergency department, compared to a less busy time, which might be Saturday morning. If you're running a paediatric assessment area do you need a different amount of staff when it's in the middle of bronx season versus another time and every area will have different peaks and troughs 
and there'll be different advantages to having different levels of staff. It may just be a volume thing and a certain level can do stuff. You may have be benefit by having more senior people who can move from one task to another and therefore actually, whilst appearing to be more expensive, might be more efficient. There are lots of, like I said, it, it's complex. So we need to have some thought about where the tools are and how they can adapt to give a more detailed and reflect some of the complexities, which may, again, vary from area to area. I said time of day, day of the week, season of the year, all these sort of things. And also unexpected pressures. So we've done a lot of work to create a very, very efficient system. And by international measures, the NHS in the UK and in Scotland is very efficient, but there's an increasing body of thought started to be backed by evidence, not just in healthcare, more to do with uh, industrial processes, that if you get very efficient, you're gonna become more fragile. And I think this is my, maybe what we're seeing when we are squeezed with periods like so-called winter or whenever you get other sort of pressures upon the system. So we have to make, decide where the balance is going to lie when we're doing our workforce planning. And at the moment, it's very much amongst efficiency. Maybe we do need to think, where's our reserve? What kind of level are we going to plan for? But again, to, for the third time, average is the wrong way to do it. Very much. Yeah. Alice McMahon. Yes, I think we have to remember that these tools are best to run once a year. So they give you a snapshot at a point in time. Um, what they don't do, as Rachel has said, is give you that skill mix or that risk element. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, we would be doing that in a ward or a community. You know, we would often start a day with, you know, are we safe to start? There would be a huddle, there would be a discussion around patient safety, staff safety, uh, and none of that should be taken away. Um, but I guess there's elements of how do we plan that into process around the tools um, and the frequency of running those tools as well. So it's, it's married up from a day-to-day -day and into an annual process if that's the way that we decide to go with these things. Um, within many of the submissions, you would see the, the support for Band 7 being made supervisory. And I think that's an important conversation that we should be having. So it shouldn't just be that everything falls to them, but actually they've got a key role to play in terms of that day-to-day -day staff safety and patient safety perspective. Um, but they also become experts in the running of the tools and the education and training of others uh, in the tools uh, as well. But I think it's really important to stress that you know, we do look at risk on a day-to-day -day basis and probably hour-to-hour -hour basis in some departments. But in terms of the process overall, it's a key element that needs to be built in more, more rigorously. Mary Ross Davey. We would uh, support those thoughts really around risk uh, and around the use of averages. Certainly, uh, we find in maternity that we have very specific uh, peaks, often nine months from Christmas, um, but that we can't necessarily uh, plan plan for. Uh, and, and where you are seeking to create a workforce that is based on averages, as has been said really clearly, you're going to have a lot of the time where you uh, midwives are are running um, short. Uh, and I think our other problem, midwifery workforce planning tools were actually some of the first workforce planning tools that were developed, and I think that's for a reason, in order to try and cope with this uh, peaks and troughs that we see. So the rest of the UK uses a workforce planning tool called Birth Rate Plus. Uh, but in the uh, around 2010, uh, it was felt in Scotland that that wasn't appropriate in the Scottish context uh, because it really didn't take into account some of our really remote and rural issues. But what we're seeing where they're trying to evolve that tool down south now uh, and looking at new models of care around continuity, that they're having issues and, and realising that that tool needs to, to develop to reflect the new ways of working. Uh, and, and as Rachel's clearly said, that is something that we're going to need to continue to do as service changes to make sure that the tools reflect new practice. And we don't know yet what that's going to look like because that, that model of care has never been done at scale. It's only been done in small research projects, randomised controlled trials. Um, so it can't, uh, the, the tools can't replace uh, risk management on a day-to-day -day basis. David MacArthur. Uh, I would wholly support that, that view and, and also pick up on the skill mix piece. Uh, in a, an acute ward in NHS Orton in the, the Balfour Hospital, uh, we have 23 beds. Uh, at any one time, they can be accommodating acute surgery, acute medicine, uh, renal, uh, gynaecology, ENT, and the list goes on, you know, including orthopaedics. So we're really very much in the business of being the specialist generalist. And, ensure, and so what we need to make sure is that any, any skill mix package, and I, I wholly support the, the approach, uh, takes due cognizance of that, in that not only do we need to be able to provide those specialist generalist people, but we also we don't have the critical mass to call on. Uh, for example, when I was theatre manager at Glasgow Royal Infirmary, 
Uh, I could call in colleagues from ITU, I could call in colleagues from any one of the 27 operating theatres we had. And I think that we, we lack that critical mass uh, in, in remote and rural. So not only is it a question of skill mix and, and assessing skill mix and managing that risk, but there is also that knock-on training element for us uh, and perhaps our training margin, uh, which should be increased in that case as well. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Uh, welcome to everybody for our second panel this morning. I'm interested in uh, the one comment that Alec McMahon made was about not another level of bureaucracy where senior charge nurses are going to say, no way, this is just going to impact my clinical supervision ability. So I would support, you know, no further, you know, pieces of paper that would reflect just additional workload. But in our submission from um, Fiona McQueen, their chief nursing officer, NHS Lothian's documentation about the number of rosters that have applied the tool and the number of staff that have applied the tool has, looks pretty successful. So can you tell us about the success of um, applying the tool and what have you done? Because training is key to engaging the staff to take on board something like this uh, workforce tool. All right, my man. With any data, there's always more questions that you want to ask than there perhaps as answers to. So that was information that came late last evening, I think, from CNO's department. Um, I've been very fortunate in, I've only been in this post for two years, but I have a deputy director who is steeped in these tools and was involved with them right from the beginning. So someone who's very expert working with uh, associate nurse directors and clinical nurse managers and charge nurses across the system. Uh, that doesn't negate the fact that there's still more education, training, things to be done. We recently did a, an internal audit of our own processes, and yes, although it feels like we do it and we do it well, actually, I don't think we're as good as we could be about the implementation sometimes of the outputs from the tool, so it's closing the circle sometimes on that piece. Um, so again, for me, very much about using what we have but building on this, because one of the things that my uh, deputy director would say that the current system that picks up the issue about the SSTS is actually, it makes it much more clunky and cumbersome. And they have to spend, she has to spend a lot of time working with others to try and get the data out of the system. So we might want to do it more often, but actually a lot of the things that are in our way are about the infrastructure, the time, the expertise to be able to do it. So having said that, I do welcome the commitment that the Scottish Government have given around the advisor posts, which will help her and work with us um, and build up that awareness, that education and uh, that training. Um, but you know, I, I think we're probably all in slightly different places. I think some people in some areas do do them, but they might do them a tabletop exercise, or it might be that the reporting system's out with the you what's been reported there, so I guess I just thought and thought there's more questions in there than we probably know just now some of the answers to. Okay. It's just um, the e-rostering is one yeah. of the things that was picked up earlier yeah. about how that can pick up the competence or Absolutely. skills required because yeah. depending on who's on shift, you yeah. need somebody who's central line trained, IV trained, catheter are trained, um, the list goes on um, to be able to give, like, competent care, whatever it is, because IVs are delivered in the community now as well. So that's so, part of this development uh, process. Absolutely. So from that point of view, NHS Loading has um, almost completely run, um, run out the e-rostering system, so an electronic rostering system. It's not even without its challenges. You know, bedding in new systems always creates some uh, challenges. But actually, what it does do is it allows you to see what the acuity of your patients are and what the skill mix is that you would require for any particular shift. It doesn't mean that you can necessarily always respond to that as effectively as you would, but it gives the charge nurse and others the absolute ability to be able to see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, does your staffing and a skill mix actually meet the needs of the patients that they're actually looking for at a point in time? So that's called safe care. The bit that sits behind that is called safe care. Um, so again, as we talked about earlier, there's, there's different systems out there, but you know, certainly with the loading, that's one that we're using, and it's proving to be successful, but not without some challenge. Thank you very much. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, can I also thank you all for your contributions? I'm, I'm particularly interested in looking at issues of uh, rural, remote and island. So I want some address remarks, particularly Mr MacArthur. Um, in your uh, statement, Mr MacArthur, your conclusion is pretty stark, where you say that you don't think the philosophy behind the Island Bill, now the Island Act, is fully reflected uh, in the staffing bill as we see it now. Could you say a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I think in, in terms of the, the, the bill statement and having regard to the distinct and geographical cultural awareness of the, uh, of the islands, 
Uh, is, it, is it a whole reflector in there? I, I think you know, a very stark reference would, would be very useful. Uh, and I reflect the, the, the opinion of my IGB and council colleagues in that as well. Mm. This is a very crucial element for us as we start to roll out. We're, we're moving to a new hospital, as, you, as you're probably aware. Uh -huh. And the philosophy behind that is that we are, we'll roll out more and more into our community uh, to ensure that we're using uh, all, the, all the, the facilities that, that we, we can use out there uh, of Attend Anywhere and, and the, the various other uh, video systems. So, you know, from, from, from our, our perspective, I suppose, it's about having that due recognition that there are some things, some things that are going to be different. Uh, we, and we're not asking for allowances to be made, we're just looking for that recognition mm. uh, so that we can, make, we can test and adjust. For example, perhaps there, there should be a... Although our, our staffing uh, tool may tell us that staffing is X for, for a given period, so that because we don't have that same resilience, perhaps it should be X plus one. Uh, and it's that type of, of, mm. of uh, view that, that I would take on it. Because the philosophy, if I recall it, behind the Islands Bill was that there'd be an island proofing. So in other words, yes. every piece of legislation need to Absolutely. be conscious of islands. So, for example, you're saying in your submission that you felt the tool wasn't su sufficient for use within small hospitals. So is that a lack of island proofing then? So that, that was a, 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 a mistake. I, I meant in terms of small wards rather right. than small, hosp right. okay. small hospitals. Uh, so from that point of view, the, 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 the tool is, is a national tool. It's applicable right across the, the, the country. Uh, and I wholly support the, the, the views in the bill uh, however, I think that for that remote and rural element, we really need to be looking at something slightly different. If we look at uh, CNO's letter that came out last night, the, there are areas of non-compliance, not just within the islands. Uh, you look at uh, Shetland. Uh, we only applied the tools this year, uh, sorry, late last year, when I came on staff there. Uh, but we also look at remote and rural areas. You look at the borders and it's non-compliance there as well. And I think that there is an issue where there is a view being taken that it doesn't really meet the need, doesn't really apply to us. Mm. I would counter that by saying that some of that is lack of understanding and lack of training. Uh, but equally, in very small units, it is a, it is a difficult concept to apply. Mm. Without, sorry, can we saying without, without being flippant, there is a, mm. a famous uh, quote, I think, from the military context, which says that, Every plan, every plan collapses with the first contact with the enemy. Uh, are you yeah. suggesting in some senses then that the plan isn't really sensitive enough um, when it comes to dealing yeah. with rural and remote areas? Well, I think the, uh, I think the, the, the quote is, no plan survives first contact. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that for, for remote and rural, it can be made to work. Uh, and I, and uh, you know, as I said earlier on, we're, never good, we're not at the perfect point within the, the tools. So we need to make this work. And we can make it work by giving people the appropriate education, mm. uh, the appropriate training. We have got support from the Scottish Government in this. And, you know, and bear in mind that my submission predated uh, the, the, uh, the additional support mm. that was being made available. So I think that you know, I'm, I'm quite confident that we can, we can make it work for us. Mm. But there does, it does need to be nuanced. Right. And a very final... Thank very briefly. Um, thank you, Convener. Is you also make a very interesting point about the tension between the tool as a financial workforce predictor yes. and as a safe staffing predictor. Yes. That's quite an interesting point. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, this, this is about the... It goes back to Rishi about risk and skill mix. Mm. And the, the way that the, the tool was used, I don't think, produced that, that skill mix sensitivity. Mm. As Alec quite really pointed out, this is something that happens once or twice a year. So the sensitivity really isn't built in to be able to, for us to make those day-to-day -day changes mm. in terms of the tool. Equally, uh, we do have our huddle every morning. Uh, it's probably easier in some ways for us because there's a, a half a dozen people around the table seeing whether we're safe or not. Uh, but equally, it's, it, it's, it's very challenging because we don't have that critical mass of people to move about. Uh, but I think the tool doesn't facilitate that that, that piece of work in terms of, of skill mix and risk. Right. Thank you very much. Thank very you. Much. <coughs> Finally, and very briefly, um, clearly we haven't had time to cover every aspect of the bill in detail. Uh, I wonder if uh, witnesses have any brief comments regarding the financial memorandum and, in particular, the absence of funding for any additional staffing uh, and whether there is adequate funding 
for full implementation of the tools as they currently exist uh, across health boards? And finally, is there a risk of a perverse incentive that running the tools may demonstrate that you don't have adequate staffing and the way to balance the tool may be to reduce the number of beds? Is that a live or real risk? in the context. Rachel Kaka. So in our um, evidence to the Finance Committee, and I know this committee is now considering the financial elements of this bill, we were critical of the assumption that we read into the financial memorandum that this bill would not necessarily result in more staffing. And we're certainly seeing um, our members under extreme pressure at this time. So set aside the, the, the vacancy rate that we're now holding, um, we have new models of care arriving, greater demand from the public, and actually the assumption that this won't result in any change to that seems a, an interesting place to start, given that this is meant to be about improving the safety and quality of services to people, and from our point of view, where that is delivered by nursing care across health and social care. So I would be deeply surprised um, if that were to be the result of the bill. Um, and uh, I think the, the submission that re we received last night seemed to address some of that by talking about the... Um, the need for any additional staffing to go into the annual uplifts and for that to be a discussion within the budget process. And if that is where we are going with this, then I think that's a, a helpful process. But whether that will be sufficient for the boards to be able to do what they need to do, I, I don't yet know. Um, in terms of the perverse incentive, I guess one of the things we need to say, and maybe it's not been said clearly enough, is nurses go into work to do a really good job. That's what they go in to do. That's why they join the profession. It doesn't matter to me whether that's a, a, a healthcare support worker or a director of nursing. Their, their aim is to go and, and do a good job and to make sure that the safety and quality of the care that nursing is provided wherever it is provided is good. So um, I would hope what, what this bill does is it provides an important balance to the um, financial positions that boards are under, and that goes back to the governance discussions that we were having around this table some time ago, and I think that is crucially important. But the idea that it would be gamed in that, I would certainly hope not, and from a nursing perspective, that's certainly not why nursing nurses go into the profession. Thank you very much. Alec Milman. So I guess we haven't really touched on workforce and workforce supply, um, and although the numbers, certainly for student nurses and midwives, have increased this year and will increase possibly next year as well, they won't be out for the next three or four years. So there's an overlap with this legislation coming into effect. Uh, from that point of view, there are vacancies, and there will continue to be vacancies, particularly in areas such as David's, where it's incredibly difficult to recruit staff. Uh, and I guess from that point of view, more of the same won't do it. So that's why we do need to look at skill mix, and that's not to denude or put down nursing. That's about actually how do we grow a workforce that can better meet needs in, in different areas. We often look to advanced nurse practitioners as a solution to many of those problems, but actually we're robbing Peter to pay Paul sometimes around that because we take them from one area and we can't replace them in terms of that. There are also areas of medicine that are difficult to recruit into. And again, sometimes the answer to that is nursing. So we need to, from a workforce and a skill mix perspective, look at this in the longer term because that shouldn't distract us from the principles and aspirations around this, but it's a reality, I guess. Uh, in terms of the unintended consequences, um, I think that would be where, in terms of clarity around the process of escalation, that if we've done everything that we can to ensure that things are as safe from a staffing point of view, but we can't because we have to then look to put two words into one word or do it, then actually that has to be supported because we're doing everything that we can. It's not because we're trying to fudge around it or not, yeah, it's because actually there's nothing else left available to people. So it's about looking after patients, it's about looking after staff. Thank you very much. David MacArthur. Uh, I would agree entirely with that. It's the, 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 the currency that we have, if we look at beds in terms of currency, the only variable that we, we, have, we have got, certainly in Orkney, and, uh, and it's reflected throughout the, throughout the health service, is the availability of beds uh, and how we do things safely. So we need to be very careful. We, we haven't hit that, this, this issue yet. You know, I'm looking, but, but looking to, to forward to the future. If we were to run out of, of, you know, if we didn't have enough staff, would we then need to close beds? Uh, and then would we ne then need to start moving our patients to the mainland? Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, and, and that sounds quite s s scaremongering. Uh, but this is where I think island bill comes in and island proofing comes in, because we need to be able to attract that out those, those outputs from students to the island. And that can, and, you know, we, we do have issues. Uh, we have issues with affordable housing, we have issues with transport infrastructure. We have issues uh, with broadband, and uh, and uh, and you know that that supervised broadband piece for young people coming out very very important 
uh, in terms of communications. So, yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree wholeheartedly with Alec, but put that uh, Islands Bill and that remote rural spin on it. Thank you very much. Can I say thank you to... Or, or David, yes, please. Yeah. Just as a last bit, I think there's a fear amongst many people who are looking at this, thinking, is this tool just going to be used to justify what many perceive to be inadequate staffing levels? And it's important that if this is to progress, we can replace that fear with hope, hope that we're going to provide evidence base and engagement with the professionals to plan and implement the adequate proper staffing so we can provide proper patient care across the entire health and social care network. Thank you very much. That's a very strong message to finish our session. Can I thank all the witnesses uh, for answering such a range of questions uh, so succinctly this after morning and afternoon? Uh, and uh, we will now go into private session briefly. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you.